Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, let me tell you about tonight's author, or uh, should I say, tonight's author's YouTube channel. Mike Jesus Langer, or Mike J. Langer, is currently available on YouTube. I've talked about him before, but we all have updated URLs now because YouTube had us do that. Mike always writes within a single universe, so if you guys have caught up on some of the previous things before, know there's more to them. There's sequels, there's series, and there's a lot of lore that follows every monster, creation, or horror that comes out of his channel, and ones that have been here. So if you like tonight's story and want to find out more, head over to youtube.com slash Mike J. Langer, or you can click the little I in the top, or you can go in the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. I've always believed in uh, human decency, you know? I've always believed that if an old person is faced with a decision to be kind or cruel, that they would choose the better option. When people spoke about human nature as if anything other than inherently altruistic, I always thought they were just hiding behind cynicism, you know, ensuring they would never get hurt. I've always believed in human decency, but then I... Uh, and I started a YouTube channel. The channel wasn't to kickstart an extravagant media career. I mean, hell, it wasn't even meant to be a fun hobby. I just needed a place to easily share videos with extended family. The idea of a stranger stumbling into a snapshot of my life never really occurred to me. But they did. They descended into my life like starving vultures and made me doubt any shred of belief I ever had in human decency. So I posted the... Uh, the first video about two years ago. It was this quick 30 second clip of my mother-in-law's birthday party. A couple months prior, her husband of 50 years had passed away and my wife, she wanted to make sure that her mother wouldn't end up spending her birthday alone. The video was simple, but sweet. Half a dozen people gathered around an old lady singing happy birthday as she struggled to blow out the candles. There were three comments. The first came from my wife's sister who was out in Europe on a business trip, B. Clark. Sorry I couldn't make it. Hope you're saving some cake for me. Happy birthday, Mom. The second from my brother, who my wife wasn't keen on inviting to family gatherings. Ray David. Doesn't look a day over 70. Stay classy, Mrs. Clark. And the third, from an account that could only be identified as its blank silhouette picture and nondescript name. Angry Gorilla 78. You people are sick. Look at that woman. She doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want to be alive anymore. I bet you she cries every night, torn between the pain of her frail body and the agony of living without the love of her life. Just let her die already. For a second, I wondered whether the comment wasn't just another one of my brother's strange jokes, but it was... I don't know, it was far too vile for even him to type out. I briefly considered responding, but it didn't let... I didn't let my anger get the better of me. I simply deleted the comment, moved on with my life. I did my best to push the internet stranger's words out of my head, and for the most part I did. Whenever we went to visit the old lonely woman in the nursing home, however, Angry Gorilla's assessment of my mother-in-law and her will to live kept echoing in my skull. When we finally laid her to rest late winter, the words they echoed even more. But there was a, f a finality to them. She was gone. Anything this YouTube commenter had to say about her was drowned out by a barrage of heartfelt eulogies. That I wouldn't have to worry about the words of another internet stranger ever again. I have a daughter. She's in elementary school. She plays the piano. I have, on multiple occasions, suggested to my wife that our daughter does not like playing the piano, but she'd hear none of it. My wife's parents never encouraged her to learn an instrument, and she regretted it all her life. She wasn't going to let our daughter miss out on music as well, so every Thursday afternoon for a year and a half, my daughter would be marched into another piano school practice. A couple months ago, she had a recital. It's her first one. On the car ride back home, our daughter made it very clear that she hated playing the piano. My wife tried convincing her otherwise, but I put my foot down and said that if the kid didn't want to learn... And she wouldn't need to learn an instrument. My daughter, being a tiny little diplomat, suggested that she could learn an instrument that wasn't stupid, like, say, a saxophone. 
At the recital, our daughter performed a rendition of Claire de Lune, while my wife caught it all on camera. The moment we got home, my wife insisted I posted the recording on YouTube so the rest of the family could see the performance. I got our daughter's permission to post the video. I promised to keep it unlisted so only our friends could see it. By the time that we sat down for dinner, the video had already amassed a pile of comments from the family Facebook chat. Possibly in the hopes of changing our daughter's mind in regard to quitting piano lessons, my wife, she read each and every comment out loud over dinner, including the one from my brother's fiancé that suggested our daughter play the song at their wedding. When my wife reached the username bashfulvulture44, however, she went quiet. She read the comment to herself under her breath, and when she finished, immediately pulled me out of the dining room. Whoever bashfulvulture44 was, they were sick. She wanted me to delete the comment immediately. Upon reading the bio myself, I raced to the computer and deleted the message. I was, I was beyond furious, trying to figure out who from the family chat would have gone through such pains to tear my daughter down, but I quickly realized Bashful Vulture 44 wasn't alone. I mean, the, the comment section was full of his ilk. Dozens of internet strangers were flooding the comment section with cruel comments about my daughter, my wife, me, even everyone else in the auditorium. I rushed to the comment section, deleting every unfamiliar account I could see. Yet whenever I refreshed the page, there was another barrage of vitriol to sort through. I was so focused on deleting the individual comments, I didn't even notice the replies. Beneath each kind comment from the family, there were replies. The internet strangers replied to my cousins, parents, in-laws with surgical cruelty. The reply chains were littered with horrible accusations and maddening vulgarity that would make one's heart hurt. But the worst fury was reserved for the top comment. Jane Best, 87. What a beautiful piece. Really hope you can play it at mine and Ray's wedding. The first reply had over 200 likes. Voluminous Serpent, 88. Is Ray's secretary coming to the wedding, Jane? Probably not, but everyone knows. The whole office knows, and so does the family. They avoid looking in your eyes for a reason, Jane. They know about the secretary, they know Ray's wives, never outlast the honeymoon. How does it feel to be a band-aid on a broken man's scuffed cock? Right beneath that reply was my brother, denying the affair and threatening to physically fight whoever wrote the comment. Beneath his reply was another menagerie of rabid animals, making full assertion about Ray's character and behavior. They spoke at length about his presumed affair. They listed dates and times and locations. The comments were detailed enough to suggest there was an air of truth about them. I stopped deleting individual comments. I deleted the video and then the entire channel. I wiped away any trace of my name from YouTube, but the, the damage was done. I don't know which members of the family had read the comments, but Ray's fiance surely did. That made all the difference. Over the next couple of weeks, Ray's wedding plans fell apart. The drama unraveled itself through long phone calls and late night visits, all set to the squealing of an inexperienced saxophone player. When the dust finally settled, we were all worse for it. The sea of faceless strangers had unearthed family secrets that made any possibility of a reunion a hellish affair. I spent a lot of time thinking about the channel. I tried comprehending what had actually happened. How the single link in a family chat had brought so many strangers into our midst, and how those strangers knew so much about us. I spent many a night trying to make sense of it all, but I resigned from the hopeless task. I moved on with my life, intent on forgetting about the masses of the internet and rebuilding the few bridges that still stood. As my brother's planned wedding date got closer, his condition went from bad to worse. Ray had some problems with the drink when we were growing up, but in his adult life, he had developed the ability to keep a lid on it. Jane breaking off the engagement, at, um, that robbed him of that ability. I knew I couldn't get Ray to stop drinking. He was far too hard-headed for that, so to make sure he wouldn't get into a car wreck and to have some semblance of control about how much he drank, I'd invite him over to our house. While my wife and daughter would sleep upstairs, Ray and I would kick back on the porch with a bottle of whiskey and try to make sense of the world. It was the night after his wedding was meant to take place. 
the night when he got drunker and angrier than he ever did before. That was when I got that email. And I was pretty sauced myself, you know. Chugging down a glass of water in the kitchen to lessen the looming hangover, and my phone dinged. An email from YouTube. They were congratulating me on my first 100,000 subscribers. The shift from confusion to bone-chilling terror happened the moment I clicked on the link attached to that email. My channel was back. It was, it was back and it was bigger than ever. The views of the two videos I deleted were well in the hundreds of thousands. But there was a third video which I hadn't posted. Titled, Ray and Jane's Wedding. The video was just a couple of views shy of a million. By the time I was back on the porch, I had ordered my brother an Uber back home. I was far too panicked to explain my sudden need for the departure, and my brother was far too drunk to question it. He put on his coat, had half a cigarette, and then, and then he, he rode off into the night with a stranger. My smartphone had found him. He left me alone with my smartphone. Immediately, I recognized the location of that video. I had seen the pictures at the old manor where Jane had planned the wedding at, at just about every family gathering leading up to Christmas. The open face sandwiches, the wedding cake, the tacky tablecloths, gold rim wine glasses. The whole wedding was exactly as Jane had planned. Except for the guests. I mean, the family was there. Ray's blood, Jane's blood, smatterings of work friends. All the guests were there. They were there, but they all looked old and exhausted and miserable. The whole guest list for the wedding was there, and they were all staring straight into the camera. The video was taking place during the newlyweds' first dance, but even they looked into the lens. In abject despair, both Jane and Ray were shadows of their former selves, yet they still held their shivering bodies against each other in a poor pantomime of a romantic dance. They danced to a broken rendition of Claire de Lune, behind the piano that was far too big for her, wearing the same dress she wore to her recital back in the happier days was my daughter. She was weeping. She was playing the instrument she hated so much and weeping and, and staring into the camera. The video refused to disappear. No matter how many times I removed it or deleted the whole channel, the video wouldn't disappear. The video didn't disappear, and the comment section kept overflowing with these ugly, vile assertions. Things about me, about my family, and everyone I had ever cared for. To think that there were people out there, hundreds, thousands of people, that were willing to comment such atrocious thoughts to public discourse made me lose all faith in human decency. I mean, what worries me more what makes my fingers quiver even as I write these words was the top-rated comment on the wedding video. 6,000 likes and climbing. Rabid Crow 69 Great content. Subbed. Can't wait for the next upload. Captain Azan stood in the viewing room. Professor Shaw beside him. His respiration was heavy, a light sweat misting his brow. Behind him stood a group of men, their faces half buried in shadow. Azan had no idea why he had been told to report to the facility. He did know one thing. Every man in the room was afraid. The air reeked of fear. Fear and desperation. Please bring him in, the professor spoke into the two-way monitor, his tie dangling like a hangman's noose. On the other side of the glass, a metal door hissed open, and two men, dressed head to toe in hazmat gear, dragged in a screaming man who they unceremoniously threw to the ground before beating a hasty retreat, the door locking in place behind them. Their captive immediately sprang to his feet, foam dripping from his lips as he continued to scream and hammer at the walls, tearing his fingernails and leaving trails of oozing blood. 
At last, he noticed the two-way mirror, and howling, launched himself forward, his eyes wild as he smashed his head into the hardened glass, over and over again, leaving blood and bits of tattered scalp behind. Jesus, Azan gasped, taking a step backwards. What is it, some kind of rabies? Shaw ignored the question. Don't worry, Captain. He'll grow still soon. If my calculations are correct, his time's almost up. It was as if the professor's words had been some kind of prophecy. The raging man suddenly became still. His bloodshot eyes started to bulge, blood beginning to pour from his nose and ears. He let out an ear-piercing shriek of pain, his hands going to his bulging stomach as it suddenly began to grow and distend, tearing through the tattered remains of his blood-soaked clothes like some malignant pregnancy. Here it comes, Shaw said, his breath quickening, steaming up the glass. Beetles poured forth from the twitching corpse, cascading over and feeding upon his ruined flesh. The screeching man's stomach exploded in a welter of blood and gore as thousands of crimson beetles poured forth from the twitching corpse, cascading over him, feeding upon his ruined flesh. What the fuck? Hazan gasped. What the hell is going on here? Shaw ignored him and spoke into the monitor once again. Begin the cleansing, please. Instantly, the overhead sprinklers shuddered to life. A spark was set and the entire room exploded into flames. The men behind Shaw began to mutter frantically, gesturing towards their clipboards and comparing notes. Turning towards Azan, Shaw gently took his arm and led him into a nearby conference room. Be seated, please, he said, turning on a nearby projector. The thing hummed to life, showing a petri dish filled with a coarse reddish-looking sand. This is a sample of Martian soil, Shaw began. Hold on a damn minute, Azan interrupted, shocked. How the hell did you get that? Shaw sighed, somewhat wearily. My dear captain, this will take a long time to explain if you keep interrupting. A lot of what we do here is classified, and you and your men are on a need-to-know basis. All I can tell you, I shall, but if some things are left out of the conversation, it is because, let me guess... Hazan smiled thinly, classified. How astute you are, Captain. Now may I please continue? Sure. It's your world, Doc. Go on ahead. Shaw, somewhat mollified, continued. This sample has been with us for some time, but it's been held in stasis while we went about examining the other four samples. Hazan was tempted to ask the obvious question, but decided against it. The professor was about as jumpy as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Besides, Azan had learned long ago that you could learn more by keeping silent than you could with a multitude of questions. The first samples gave us nothing, completely devoid of life. But the fifth sample must have contained something even our most advanced equipment couldn't have managed to locate. You now believe it was some kind of spore or parasite. I can assure you, Captain, he said, wiping a trembling hand on the side of his face. Every precaution was taken, yet still, somehow... This thing managed to infect one of our scientists. One of our top people, in fact. David's death was a great loss, not only to us, but to all of humanity. David, Azan pushed gently. Yes, Shaw replied. Dr. David Peters. After examining the sample, he fell ill. Of course, this rang alarm bells, and he was immediately quarantined. He and most of his assistants, unfortunately one of them, managed to escape the base. But we'll discuss him in a moment. Poor David had collapsed, and uh, he had a kind of sudden fever. He was only out for a few hours, but when he awoke, he was a madman. Wild, incredibly strong, as only a true maniac can be. But that wasn't the worst of it. He began to attack people, biting them, tearing at their flesh, swallowing it down. Finally, we managed to restrain him and get him locked away in a padded cell. But soon after it happened, the very same thing you saw today. Again, he hit the projector button, and another slide whirled into place, showing an insectoid-like creature flayed open and pinned to a white plastic board, surrounded by its own black, viscous-looking blood. Hazan wasn't quite sure what he was seeing. The thing, in some ways, looked arachnid in nature, but had a hard exoskeleton shell. It seemed more mouth than anything else, with large, piercing-like mandibles and a multitude of small, black, shining eyes that were dotted around in random parts of its body. All he knew was that this thing was alien in nature, and unlike anything he had ever seen before. 
We managed to contain the first outbreak, Shaw said, never taking his eyes off the creature. But what about the others? Zahn broke in. Ah, well, there's the rub, Shaw smiled sickly. Initially, four other members of staff were infected, all of those who assisted David that day. After we destroyed the second swarm that he swallowed hard, manifested from the second host, things suddenly began to change. How so? Azan asked, leaning closer. The third victim, he said, checking his notes. One Christine Cumberland. Her gestation period took much longer. You can see the damn things straining to get out, but they wouldn't emerge. When at last they did, we killed them immediately, but the fourth victim took even longer. It was as if the damn things knew we were waiting for them. And when they finally did emerge, they didn't bother feeding on their host, but tried to scatter, scurrying up the walls, across the floor, ceiling, as if seeking a way out. Azan finished the sentence. Yes. Just so. Shaw sighed, rubbing his temple. You think they have intelligence, don't you, Shaw? Yeah. The professor replied sitting upright and adjusting his glasses. Yeah, I do. Can't be sure, but I'm beginning to believe it's some kind of hive mind. But there is more. And once again, he hit the projection button, and another slide slotted into place. It was the same creature, only now much bigger, with fewer legs and eyes. They keep changing with every brood. They seem to be adapting. The first one we caught and dissected. We couldn't make head nor tail of its anatomy. Completely alien. By the third hatching, the, the things had already developed a set of lungs, as if they were trying to adapt more fully to the atmosphere, to become more like us. Sweet Jesus, Azan said, dragging his eyes away from the creature on the screen. And you said one of these things, one of the hosts, managed to get off the base. Yes, before we knew of the infection, Shaw added quickly. And do you have him? Yes. It was the man you witnessed die in the other room. Thank God for that, Hazan said, slumping in his chair. No, you misunderstood, Captain, Shaw replied. He managed to make it all the way home. And thankfully, it's not very far, a small village just a few miles down the road, but the whole village is now quarantined. That's why you and your team have been brought here. You've been assigned to my command by the Ministry of Defense, and I shall be your liaison on the matter. From under his lab coat... He produced a sealed document. Azan took it and cracked it open, his mouth agape. You're gonna wipe it out, aren't you? The whole village. Not me, Captain. You. You and your men are going to exterminate every man, woman, and child in that place. And what if they're not infected? Azan shot back. Tell me, Captain. Is that a risk you're willing to take? Less than an hour later, Azan and the 2nd Battalion SAS were geared up and flying towards the village of Evershore. Professor Shaw sat beside him, looking a little green around the gills as the chopper was hit by strong autumn winds. Five minutes later, Azan got his first look at Evershore. I could hardly believe what he was seeing. The entire village had been surrounded by steel makeshift walls, topped with vicious-looking razor wire. Hastily erected, scaffold towers strategically placed around the wall looked down into the village. On the ground, regular army troops ran to and fro, and it seemed a whole sea of camouflaged tents filled a nearby field. Jesus, Hazan turned to Shaw. All this in less than 48 hours. You have the full backing and might of the UK government behind us, Shaw yelled above the whirring rotors as the chopper touched down. Even in all his years in the SAS, Azan had never seen anything like this. Still, he had a job to do and leapt in the chopper. His men hot on his heels. He was immediately met by a grim-faced man. He wore no rank or insignia, but had the air of a military man all the same. Captain Azan, I presume, he said, offering up his hand. Azan took it. It was pumped hard once and then dropped. The other man never gave his name. Dr. Shaw! he said, nodding to the professor, who now stood by Azan's side. Please follow me, gentlemen. I'll give you a quick stirrup. The two men followed him into a nearby tent. I'm afraid it's like you suspected, the big man said to Shaw. The village is infected. 
Those little bastards were hiding inside those people all along. No sign of any aggressive behavior until we started putting up the walls. That's when they attacked. We managed to force them back using flamethrowers. Most of them seem to be at the Romero stage right now. The Romero stage? Hassan asked. You know, the other man replied. Great A, Night of the Living Dead. It was a joke made up by my men. Guess it's their own way of relieving the tension. Besides, these fucking things act like zombies trying to eat people and all. So have you seen any signs of the beetles yet? Shaw asked. No, not yet, the grim-faced man replied. In fact, after the first attack, they retreated back into their homes. But they're up to something. You feel it in my bones. I don't understand this, Azan said, turning to Shaw. Why don't they just swarm and escape? Even with that wall in place, they could surely find a way out. I don't know, Shaw replied. We aren't even sure how the infection spreads. Maybe through a bite? Maybe the damn thing breathes out more spores. We have measures in place, the big man said, in case they do swarm. Did you notice the trench dug around the base of the wall? Can't say I did, his aunt admitted, cursing himself. The whole thing had him shook up. Well, it's there, filled with a certain jelly somewhat akin to napalm. If one, just one of those things tries to get out, boom, oh fucking trench goes. And you think they know this? Hazan asked. I don't know much about how smart these things are. That's down to the dock, he said, nodding to Shaw. Jesus Christ, Hazan said, throwing up his arms. If we know fire kills these damn things, why don't we just send in a whole bunch of hellfire missiles? Blow the place off the face of the earth. Be kind of hard to cover that up, the man said. Right now, we're just about managing to keep it out of the press and offline. We have a cover story in place. But first, we gotta get rid of any evidence, and you and your team have been picked up for cleanup duty. So saddle up, Captain. You're going in. Azan had less than an hour to brief his men and get them geared up. The village was somewhat larger than Azan had first thought. Nestled in a small valley, it consisted of a main street with numerous other houses dotted on both sides of the gently sloping hills. Population, at last census, just a little over 500 people. Azan and his crew, along with Doc Shaw, were airlifted in by helicopter, which landed on a nearby school playing field. He had a team of 20 elite men dressed head to toe in NBC gear, respirators and all. Half the squad carried compact but deadly flamethrowers across their backs, the rest an assortment of automatic rifles loaded with a mix of high explosive and full metal jacket tracer rounds. Okay, Azan said as the heli dusted off. Radio check. Everybody copy. Each member of the squad answered affirmative, their voices sounding almost metallic in Azan's headset. Switching over to Channel 1, he addressed Shaw. Okay, Doc, he said, turning his face to the man. We're on Channel 1, which is a secure channel. The rest of the men are on Channel 2. High Command is on 3. I'll let you deal with them. You relay orders to me from Command, I give it over to them. Do you copy? Yes. I copy, Shaw replied. Please repeat standing orders and any changes of protocol. Azan continued. Shaw sighed. Standing orders are the same as before. Uh, secure the town. Wipe out all infected, which is, in this case, the entire town. Roger that, Shaw said, turning away. Quickly, he flicked over to Channel 2. Okay, boys, he addressed the men. This happy asshole says we have to wipe out everyone in this goddamn village. But that's not how we roll. The men murmured their agreement. So this is how we're going to play this thing. Anyone showing signs of infection or aggressive behavior, we put them down. Any other civilians, we round them up, take them to the extraction zone. After that, whatever these government assholes want to do with them is up to them. But I won't stain my hands or the regiment's reputation with innocent blood. Are we clear? The men all clicked their radios twice in acknowledgement. Okay then, Azan said, slinging his rifle. Let's move. The village was in shambles. It seemed every window was smashed. The pavement littered with glass that crunched under their booted feet. A few cars had been burnt out, ruined shells still smoldering in the growing wind. Looks like we missed the party, Captain, the man at Azan's side said. It was Azan's second in command, Sergeant Michaels, a big, tough man that Azan had served with many times before. Just then, another voice came over the comms. Got a body here, Captain. Hazan quickly looked around and saw one of his men nearly in the entrance of a nearby lobby. Hold position, he said to the rest before hurrying across. Sweet Jesus, 
Hazan sighed, seeing the state of the body, which was nothing more than a bloody skeleton and torn, tattered rags, the jaw hanging open as if in some kind of eternal scream. Hazan turned to Shaw and signaled him across. What do you think, Doc? He said, switching to his channel. Completely devoured, Shaw replied, his voice dispassionate. Which means they're starting to swarm. We need to end this. End it real fast. Okay, Hazan said, addressing the men. We're splitting up into four teams. Alpha team, take the west. Bravo, east. Charlie, south. Sergeant Michaels, myself, Trooper Kane, and the Doc will check the north part of the village. I want a building by building search. Now move. The men quickly assembled themselves in four-man teams and then hurried away. The attack came only a few moments later. Hazan and his men had been searching a nearby post office on Main Street when Trooper Kane, who had been guarding the doorway, suddenly opened fire. Hazan spun around, cocking his rifle, and ran for the door. From across the street, a horde of men, women, and children, their stomachs horribly distended, blood pouring from their eyes, ears, and mouths as they gnawed and chomped at the air. Every time one of them was hit, they would fall to the floor, their stomachs bursting open, thousands of beetles issuing forth, swarming towards the four men. Flamethrower! Hazan screamed in the mic. Sergeant Michaels raced to the front, pushing Keen aside as he sprayed the oncoming horde with fiery liquid death. Nearby, Hazan smashed out a window and began firing into the now-retreated horde, cutting them down so the flamethrower could continue its grisly work. At last, he was done. But now his comms were alive with the sound of panicked voices and the sporadic sound of gunfire. Soon, those sounds turned to the screams of anguish and dread. And then, even more terrible... Only the sound of a dead silence. Bravo team, report! Alpha, come in! Hazan cried desperately into the mic, but there was nothing. Anyone, report! They're gone, Captain, Michael said, shaking his head sadly. They're all gone. From the corner of his eye, Hazan saw Shaw suddenly tear his respirator from his face as he began to laugh hysterically. Doc, Hazan said, grabbing the man roughly by the shoulders. What the hell's wrong with you? No orders, I'm afraid, he said, tapping at his earpiece. Looks like your suggestion to high command has been taken very seriously. They're going to wipe this place off the face of the earth. What? Hazan cast. Wh wh why? Isn't it obvious? Shaw spat at him. No longer any need for a cover-up. They must have had another outbreak somewhere else. Now this is about cleaning up the goddamn mess. Fuck. How long do we have? We need to get the hell out of here. Again, Shaw laughed. You don't get it. We won't let us out. We won't risk further infection. It's all about damage control. Suddenly, Shaw pulled his firearm. I won't go out like that. I'm not going to burn like one of these goddamn things out here. Shaw, no! Hazan screamed, lunging for him, but it was already too late. Shaw put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger, <laughs> spattering his brains all over the wall, his body hitting the floor like a sack of meat. Mother of God. What do we do now? Keen began to babble. Hazan ignored him and switched his radio to channel 3. Come in, command. This is Delta Team requesting extraction. I repeat, this is Delta Team requesting immediate extraction. But there was only static. Nothing. Hazan cursed, tearing the respirator from his face. Not a goddamn thing. So how do we get out? Keen said, his face white, his voice strained. With this... Michael said, not waiting for Hazan to reply. From his pack, he took out a block of C4 and a small detonator. Hazan began to smile. I don't remember telling you to bring explosives with you, Sergeant. He who dares wins, the Sergeant said, returning Hazan's grin with one of his own. I think that school we just passed should give us plenty of cover from the assholes on the tower. We should prime it, lay it on the wall, and boom, we're out of the shithole. All right, gentlemen, Hazan said, leaping to his feet. Grab your shit, we're leaving. Quickly, they made their way back to the school, encountering no infected as they hurried on. Once they got there, they scaled the fence, kept close to the side of the building. It was getting dark now, the shadows growing longer, giving them perfect cover as they turned a corner, the looming walls above them. Look, Keen said, pointing towards one of the skeletal-like towers. It's empty. They must have all left. Which means whatever's coming is coming soon. Work fast, Sergeant, Ozan replied, 
And just then, from behind them, came a terrified scream. Azan span around as the scream came again from the nearby window inside the school. Sounds like a kid, Keen said, licking his lips nervously. Yeah. Azan said, yeah. Sergeant, give me that flamethrower. The hell are you talking about? The sergeant replied. You ain't thinking of going in there. No time for debate, Azan snapped at him. Give me the flamethrower, sergeant. That's an order. The sergeant did as he bid. Azan quickly strapped it on. Blow that wall, sergeant. Get the hell out of here. That said, he turned from the other man and boosted himself through the window, landing heavily inside. He was in a long corridor, classrooms on either side of him. Everywhere he looked, it seemed like strange shadows, scrawling and undulating across the walls, the air heavy with the scent of his own fear. He was just rounding a corner when one of the infected leapt from the shadows, spattering him with hot, diseased foam as it chomped and lunged for his throat. With a cry, Azan managed to get an arm up under its chin, forcing the creature backwards. His free hand scrambled for his knife, which he drew from its sheath and thrust it again and again into the creature's side. Blood erupted from its mouth, spattering the inside of Azan's neck and face. The hot smell of copper filled the air. With one last Herculanean effort, he shoved the creature backwards, freeing himself from its terrible embrace before thrusting in the knife deep into the howling creature's eye socket, obliterating the diseased mind within. Another scream rang out, this one even more desperate. Azan, fighting off exhaustion, came on the run, checking each classroom frantically until at last, he came upon her. A little girl sat huddled on top of a high metal cabinet, the floor around her swarming with crimson beetles. The girl saw him, her eyes widening in surprise, but Azan ignored her and opened up on the squirming mass, screaming in fear and outrage as he burned the writhing horde. At last they lay still and Azan leapt across the dying flames, scooping up the little girl in his arms as he ran from the classroom and down the shadow-shrouded halls. Moments later, there came an explosion, and Azan smiled, knowing his men had escaped. They're at the window now. The terrified girl sobbing in his arms. Easy. Easy, he said, helping her through the window and following after. He was just about to grab her up when the whole world exploded behind with a deafening roar. It scooped him up, a hot fist ramming into his back, throwing him forward through the hole in the wall and smashing him into the ground. There was a sudden pain like nothing he'd ever known, and he passed into oblivion. He awoke some time later, covered in dust and bits of loose rubble, his skin tight and tender. He tried to sit up, but was only able to move his head from side to side. That's when he saw them. What was left of them, anyway. Trooper Keane and Sergeant Michaels, both of them no more than bloody skeletons, the flesh ripped from their bones. Only the tattered remains of their uniforms identifying who they had once been. And just then, a face loomed above him. It was the girl, the little girl that he had rescued. Seemingly untouched by the terrible explosion, she grinned down at him, her mouth growing impossibly wide, her eyes black and soulless. This world is ours now. She crooned, and Professor Shaw's words blazed across Cezanne's mind. With every spawning, they change, adapt. It's like they're becoming more like us. So fresh, the thing above him tittered. This world, so full of life, so much to consume, so much to devour. She was changing now beginning to writhe and twist until her entire body collapsed into a thousand squirming beetles. They swarmed over Azan, tearing at his flesh as he howled into the night. A death cry that would signal the end of all civilization. Have you ever worked somewhere so long that the days have kind of blended together and you forget when it started and when it ends that's the feeling i got when i began work at this call center downtown okay? the place is constantly busy and that that really isn't the problem but my mind tends to wander and i sometimes can't shake the feeling that what i'm doing here doesn't really matter i've even voiced these concerns to my boss who's insisted that big changes are coming and they'll reinvigorate the workplace but i'm not sure what we're doing here just doesn't seem to matter. A day is just a day, and I've often lost track of weeks at a time. It got so bad that 
Last week, I, I asked if I could be placed in a different shift, and maybe that would switch things up a bit. Graveyard was the only one available, so I figured, you know, why not? Let's see where it takes me. The first few nights are pretty routine. Boring, starting to make me regret ever signing up for the change. But then something extraordinary happened. I was wandering the halls up near the fourth floor trying to find the restroom because the ones on the floor I work on were being remodeled and I noticed a door that I had never seen before. The way this building set up, you see, the, the offices that we work at normally face west and we can see a little bit of the mountains that dip over the horizon. It's a pretty scenic view, almost enough to make you think what you're doing here, stuck in a cubicle all day, actually means something. But anyways, the point is that this side of the building is mostly large panel windows, ones that show off the epic desert area and the valleys beyond. We're kind of out here in the middle of nowhere, right? And it's it's a bit lonely. It's solemn, I guess. And there definitely shouldn't have been a door in the middle of that hallway leading to seemingly out of the building and into thin air. I think I was sure that I was hallucinating, but still, I feel the need to investigate, right? So I walk over to it and reach for the handle, but I stop short. Weird sensation in the back of my brain told me that this was a bad idea. I looked around. Hallways were deserted except for me. I somehow convinced myself to push that feeling aside, and I opened the door. I was expecting to see a long drop to the mountains below, but instead I found myself staring at a bland hallway that was the same as the one I was standing in. Another corridor, but that didn't seem possible. For some reason, I just, I, I chose to take a step inside the newfound hallway. Immediately, the fluorescent lights illuminated the long hallway to reveal further corridors branching off into unknown spaces, and I found myself wanting to explore. As I got midway down the hall, though, that odd sensation of danger was tingling down my spine again, and I, I turned to leave. Only to find that the door I was just in, it, it didn't exist anymore. I was now just completely within this strange abstract space I mean the, the the door that I just stepped out of it was it was no longer there just another long corridor that seemed to stretch on into infinity The walls and the carpet, they were all the same, so bland and meaningless that it was difficult to determine which way I was meant to go. I was beginning to realize that coming here was a mistake, and I began to wonder if I was dreaming. Sadly, though, no matter what method I used, I couldn't wake up. I decided to try to trace the hallways and determine where they went. Uh, using a small lead pencil from my own pocket, I drew a line down the side of the wall. I figured it might be the only way that I could hope to find a way back to where I came from. For a long time, I kept tracing the wall to my right, figuring that it would take me somewhere different. I, mean, I, never, I never once encountered the line that I drew in front of me. I could tell that I was making progress, or at least I, I mean, it felt that way. I stopped after about ten minutes I began to second-guess myself, turning around, following the line back the way that I'd come. It took less than five minutes to reach the beginning. But I mean, but, but, but I mean I've been wandering, I've been drawing for nearly half an hour. How is that even possible? I started to run down the corridor, turning left and right and hoping that the maze would finally just reach a climax, and then, just when I was beginning to lose hope of ever getting out, I saw a door again. I rushed towards it, I flung it open. The familiar setting of the office I was accustomed to returned, and I, I ran out. I looked back at the door. The door was gone. And the eerie experience was over. But it lingered with me that night even preventing me from sleeping, haunting my brain, making my body shake. 
I took as many sleep aids as I could, without overdosing at least. And I finally fell unconscious. I told myself it was simply an awful, feared dream, or something beyond my understanding, and I reassured myself that it would never happen again. And little did I know it would change everything about me and everyone that worked there. The following time I was at work, I was trying to take calls and forget about the weird experience that I had on the fourth floor. You know, when, when this strange noise came over my headset. At first I thought it was a glitch in my software, you know, like some kind of feedback. But then I heard a voice amidst the sound. Michael Long, come to the fourth floor. Room 302. Immediately. I mean, it was a robotic message, but it was so precise that I knew it wasn't a mistake. Someone was summoning me, because I'm both an idiot and so damn curious, I did as instructed. I went up to the room. The entire floor, it was just, it was deserted again, and part of me wanted to search for that damn door, but I kept on task. I found the room with no issues. There were two smartly dressed people inside, a man and a woman, and they were standing on the opposite sides of a long conference table. I mean, I didn't recognize either of them, but then again, this is a big place, so I doubted that I would have. Something about their demeanor told me that they didn't work for the call center. They were just like, I don't know, government or military. The, the woman confirmed this. Michael Long, please have a seat. My name is Emma Carter. I work for a think tank called Icarus, she said, offering me a drink. I did as I was told, and realized why that eerie feeling was still in the air. As I said, you work for that other place that I went to, huh? I immediately recognized the mythical connections. Icarus. I mean, that's like an endless maze of some kind, and the legendary Icarus somehow was involved. My Greek literature is foggy from college, but the name, uh, it's catchy for sure. Icarus. Icarus' father built the labyrinth for a sole purpose, to keep a monster at bay. We made ours for another reason. We want to analyze the endless possibilities of virtual reality, the man said. Wait, so, the, so that, that door, the one I went into yesterday, it was like a, like a, a simulation, a, a VR simulation or something? Carter gave me a tense smile. More like... An evaluation. The mere fact you're able to see the door, and then move also freely through the corridors, it's a major breakthrough. The man slid a small disc towards me, and when I touched it, a massive hologram revealed itself. The place that you stood on is more than just a virtual reality, it's an alternate dimension. We discovered a way to harness its energy and allow for passage between dimensions, but it's been extremely unstable. In fact, often we've been unsuccessful in being able to get anyone to even find the passage at all. We began to suspect that perhaps the issue wasn't the dimensional gate itself, but the subjects, he told me. The maze was larger than I had expected. In fact, it seemed almost endless. An impossible dream that kept circling like a, like a Mobius strip. How is this designed? Feels like it's 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 far too advanced for anything we are ensuring from the center, right? I told them. Emma gave her coworker a glance, and he gave a curt nod, giving her permission to speak. There's something about you and a few other select employees here at the Brighter Futures Call Center. We suspect that you might have certain biological markers that make it easier for you to pass across the gate. Do you recall when you were first interviewed and asked for multiple lab tests? She asked. I paused and I frowned. The memory was so vague that I hadn't even thought to register it. Are you saying that you only hired me because you wanted me as some kind of guinea pig? I asked as I stood up, ready to walk out. I mean, I wasn't comfortable in being their stooge for this human experiment. And then I realized that was probably the case for everyone that worked here. All of us being used for this strange 
development. I suggest you calm down. If you walk out that door, there's a chance that the markers within you will begin to flux due to the fact that you've recently passed through the dimensions that you still have a connection to. In a sense, you are like Theseus from the legend, still trapped inside the labyrinth. But I wasn't listening. I, mean, I didn't care if they offered me thousands of dollars or some like lifetime stipend. This felt wrong. Was anything we did here even impactful or was it all simply for this other experiment? I needed to know. How many people have you been monitoring here? I asked. Currently only you and five others. Should we successfully be able to determine the root of the simulation, we should be able to do more by the end of the year, Emma answered. The, the root. Okay, so what's that supposed to mean? Are you, are you saying you people didn't create it then? Suddenly, it felt like my head was spinning. The man was still standing and extending his hand as though to grab me from falling. We want to make you an offer. To return through the door and to observe and record everything you find there. Once we determine its origin and unlock its potential, our entire species can leap generations ahead in development and evolution, he said. You don't even know if I can make it back in one piece, I said as I opened the door and shook my head. Find another nameless lackey to do your bidding. Okay, I don't, I don't want any part of it, I said as I took a step out the door. Don't forget our warning. We are offering you the chance to return home. Without our help, the next time you traverse the blank spaces, you might not return home, Emma warned. I... I had no way of being sure if that was a threat, so instead of responding, I made good on my word, and I left. I closed the door behind me, and I walked straight ahead. As I suspected, when I turned around, the door had disappeared. It made me wonder if... The people I had talked to had even been real. Was I hallucinating? I decided to clock out early and get a physical exam. I needed some kind of basis in reality to establish what was happening to me. But the quick physician showed nothing, and I couldn't afford any kind of scans. As far as I knew, I was still normal. So did that even explain what was happening to me? What if the experience itself was real? What was within the blank space that called out to me? I googled the Icarus think tank, but didn't find anything on it. Of course, I mean, I should have anticipated that. If they did work for the government, it was doubtful anything would be found on the project online. I tried to push it out of my mind. But as time passed, I saw that strange... blank door. At all different times. Even when I was away from the office, it, it frightened me. I wanted to destroy it, and yet, and yet I was drawn to it at the same time. I thought I was crazy at first. Seeing strange doors out of nowhere, dreaming about, about endless corridors. I mean, who, who would think that was normal? And then, almost a week after my first incident, I heard a co-worker named Lucia mention that she was having issues to one of her friends. There was this weird, empty floor. I got lost in it last night. It took me hours to get back here, she explained. But the friend thought it was just a story. When we were alone, I took a risk. I revealed my own connection to this phenomenon. Lucia actually seemed relieved. I thought I was going crazy, she admitted. Has anyone talked to you about the doors? I asked. What? No. Nobody except you seems to know. Suddenly we had a connection that only we seemed to know about. But I was sure there was more. I told her how two strange people had tried to recruit me and steered her away. Her eyes got wider and more frightened with each word. It's some kind of conspiracy crap. So they haven't contacted you? I asked. No. Give me their names if you can. My father has a few old friends in the army. He might he might be able to figure this out, she told me. I scribbled them down and I passed it to her. As she left, I felt a little relieved to think that I wasn't alone. I mean, maybe together we could solve this puzzle. And all the while, 
Strange tension I felt coming to work grew and grew, but this was a co-worker, I mean, a potential ally in this battle that was reaching out. I received an email from Lucia a few days later, but it warned me not to open it at the call center. The rest of that day, my heart was pounding. Her insistence to not open the email at work told me that we were, we were being monitored at the call center. I mean, did that mean that our supervisors were aware of what the government was doing and signed off on it? We needed proof. Maybe we could sue their asses for this or something. I opened the email as soon as I could at home, surprised to find that it was a video file of Lucia as she was walking towards the mysterious door that kept appearing for both of us. Here goes, everyone. See you on the other side, she told the audience. And she stepped across the barrier, but the camera went haywire. This, this bizarre shrieking noise resonated across my brain. I nearly tossed my headphones across the room in response. I, I mean, I can't put my finger on it, but that noise was unearthly. The video eventually returned to a blank screen, and I, I heard heavy breathing, and Lucia was on the floor. But she looked like she'd been attacked. Then this, this creature, this, this shadowy thing, grabs her ankles and drags her off the screen. I tried to freeze the image to get a look at it, but I, I can only see fuzzy pixels. It, it didn't even look like it should exist. It wasn't even a, a three-dimensional shape. Yet it, it moved like a, like a, like a living, breathing beast. Heavy breathing filled the recording, and the camera moved. My heart skipped a beat as I recognized the man from the conference room. He had been a partner with this Icarus project. If you want your co-worker to live, come to room 302 tomorrow night. This video will self-destruct. Just like the old school movies whose words came true and the clip was corrupted. I sat there unsure how to respond. I should have called the police, but I doubt they would even believe me. Instead, I called my boss and requested to be placed on a graveyard shift again. I had to find out what happened to Lucia. I clocked in that evening around 8 p.m. and scheduled my break for 10. I'd only have a 30-minute lunch break to find the Icarus Men in Black again. And I prayed that it'd be enough. Just like before, I went to the fourth floor, started to wander. And the silence, it was, silence was deafening. There were no mystery doors this time, but it definitely felt like I was going in the right direction. And just when I felt like I should give up, a voice called to me. And I saw the man standing in the doorway. Immediately, I rushed him, pushed him inside and against the wall. Where is she? What did you do to her? Michael, that will be enough, the woman sharply commanded, but I was tired of playing by their rules. Taking out my ballpoint pen, I placed it mere inches for the man's pupil and shouted, I'm not doing jack until I know that woman is okay. I'm fine, Michael, a voice confirmed, and before I knew how to react, the man shoved me away, breaking my arm as he did. I fumbled onto the ground and looked across the table, stunned to see that Lucia was now on the other side in the same uniform as the others. I couldn't hardly move because of the pain, and I heard them mumble something to each other. Dexter, you went overboard, damn it, we need him, I heard Carter say. Someone came into the room and injected my arm with something even more painful than my break. I laid there for a moment, the room spinning as I felt my body begin to heal. The hell was that? I said as I realized I could move my arm again. Particles from within the alternate universe injected into your body to hyper-aggressively stimulate your natural healing, Emma told me, and then gave me a lopsided smile. Families in the medical field, please quit acting so dumbfounded all the time. You're creating products for medical trials now. What happened to trying to be cautious and testing this out? I asked, glaring at Lucia. What's happened to you? They brainwash you? The simplest way I can explain this is that I'm not the co-worker you remember, she responded. The man who identified himself as Dexter said that the labyrinth was like a web or a hall of yarn, and at the end of each of those unraveling strings was an alternate door that led to a different universe. So this pocket dimension, it's like a, it really is like a connecting hallway to other realities. Something like that even possible, I asked. Again, this is why people like you are vital to understanding this phenomenon. My focus was on Lucia. Wherever you're from, 
Were there also people there like me that could traverse the blank spaces? I asked. Quite so, Mr. Long. We found several. However, we had been unable to figure out why. Just as tests were done on you, similar tests were run on the ones that we could identify. There's nothing out of the ordinary. Or rather, the tests we ran weren't sufficient to produce the desired data, she told me. And you think that by going back, we could find more? I asked the group. All of them seemed in agreement with this idea, but I wasn't quite ready to budge and stick my neck out for such a risky operation. I want it in writing that if for some reason I die or disappear or whatever, this whole thing gets shut down here, okay? These people don't need to be involved. Take your nonsense somewhere else. You aren't exactly in a position to give a demand, Dexter reminded me. This is a negotiation, right? You need me to get this data collected, so what can you offer that I would be interested in? I countered. Dexter shifted uncomfortably, and Emma smiled, surprised by my tact. She nodded and said, fine. We don't need the call center anyway. It's just one of several vantage points that could get us in the blank spaces. Is there anything else you need, Mr. Long? A record of any other interactions with the dimension that you've managed to keep. Like, like what you found on Lucia, the other Lucia, I mean. I said, nodding towards the one in the room. That record was sent to us deliberately. We viewed it as the first message that we had received from the other side. I paused, standing up and trying to wrap my head around what they were saying. So, Dexter wasn't there? I asked. I was. But once again, you're thinking in terms on the universe you understand and know. The iteration you saw on that screen was sending us a message. Of what? I can't say, Dexter responded. This is... Making my head hurt, I admitted. But I agreed to the terms, and I said that I would return first thing in the morning. They promised benefits, life insurance, triple my pay. They seemed desperate, if I'm being honest. And it made me feel like I had control of the situation. But that... That couldn't have been further from the truth. The next morning at my desk, there was a note explaining that I needed to visit the company nurse and to request a specific appointment time with a Dr. West. Supposedly, he would be the one to give me another serum, which would increase the likelihood of finding the blank spaces. Let's also record your thoughts onto a cloud service. Everything you're experiencing related to the other dimension will be filtered here for documentation, West told me. The injection reminded me of what Icarus had already done. It told me that once again, these people were keeping something secret and close to their chest. It felt exhilarating, though, to finally cross the threshold again. I mean, I've been thinking of the blank space for so long, and now to be face to face with potential answers, I actually opened the door without fear and stepped across into the virtual space. Wes told me that my very thoughts were being recorded, and I guess, I guess that freaked me out. But I tried my best to adapt and focus to the scenario in front of me. The corridors are spacious and plain, but also narrow and cramped. For such an empty space, they give a vibe of, of claustrophobia that I'd never felt before. It's been almost a day, although to be honest, I can't tell time like I used to. There isn't day or night here. I don't get tired or hungry. In fact, I don't think that I've even needed to use the bathroom. I'm thinking about and wondering if my body was actually undergoing some metaphysical change with this dimension. The creature that I saw attack Lucia was, I mean, if, for example, it was only two dimensions. Could it be that within the space, everything exists outside of reality that we understand? It's a complete glitch in our perception of the universe. A road that's leading nowhere. On the second day, I found what looked like a different type of room. This one was black and square and... For some reason, I got the feeling that it was near the center of the maze. There was a code on a door that led me to an inner chamber. On a whim, I typed in the word Icarus. Then it opened. The room was dark. The oxygen felt light. It was cold and ethereal. I followed the sound of faint footsteps. Are those my own? 
I wasn't even sure why this room had suddenly existed. Was the space itself taunting me, leading me into a deeper hell? I soon found the answer as I rounded another corner. There were tubes. Tubes of people. All in stasis of some kind, hanging on the wall of the corridor. Each of them had a number carved under their pod, a, a Roman numeral. I saw that one of them looked like Dexter, another, another reminded me of a younger version of Lucia. I froze, I, I tried my best to, to not scream as I saw one marked with a Roman numeral for three, it looked like, like me. But its face wasn't finished. The features, they were still being completed by some unknown software that was constantly updating this, this fresh body. Was that really me? Did that new me have a, a soul? Was, was this all the product of some mad god? The end of the hallway led into a control room of some sort, data being compiled and calculated. Some of it didn't even seem possible. And on the screens I saw hundreds, if not thousands, of creatures that resembled that strange limber monster that attacked Lucia on camera, each of them roaming a different version of the maze. What are you doing here? A voice cracked the silence, and I turned to see an older woman there, hair as white as snow, her eyes paler than the blue sky. She was holding a key in her left hand like her life depended on it. Icarus sent me, I told her truthfully. Icarus? So the first experiment was a success then. And now they've come to bargain, she said, as she walked past me and placed the key into a small slot next to the monitors. All of them began to rewind the videos, and the shrieking of the monster echoed loudly as I covered my ears. I, I was told to document the origins of this place. Are, are, are you its creator? I asked. The woman laughed. My name is Levina Pickman. I wish I could take credit for this masterpiece, but I'm afraid not. Just another cog in the machine. But if you're telling the truth, it's already too late. Too late to stop any of this, the woman rambled. Icarus! Icarus is searching for answers. So am I. What made people like me and Lucia special? I asked. She turned to me, a gun now in her hand. As she fired one bullet into my stomach, I hunched over in confusion, and the old woman fired another in my kneecap. I should think that would be obvious. She paused as she stepped over me and put the gun to my head. You were born here. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. A man bearing a striking resemblance to Emma Carter stood over me and took off his glasses. You're awake. Congratulations, the surgery was intense, but we managed to pull you through it, he said. I'm sorry, where, where am I? I asked, looking out the window. The landscape reminded me of a rural Canada. Washington State, you were dead for like two hours, Mr. Long. And now, you're alive again. I checked my arm. I saw a tattoo of a Roman numeral three. A shudder going up and down my spine. I didn't fully understand everything, but I knew that the memories of the maze and Icarus had to be true, yet... Yet now it seemed as though I was in an entirely different... body. A different long from a... from a, a, a different... universe. I got released from the hospital the next day. And it's been almost a month since then. I haven't heard from Icarus. There's no record of the life I knew. This Michael was an architect in, in a small Washington town. I, I told myself that I could try to live this life. I could make it my own. But my soul hurts. I know something beyond the veil of reality is still calling to me. I know one day in this new life, a door will appear and I'll, I'll have to step across back into that hell. And I pray that this time, I'm ready for what's on the other side.
Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to remind you that I'm a narrator on Chile. The awesome horror app that features over a thousand horror stories, over a dozen narrators, and some of you might recognize those narrators from YouTube, as well as full-length novels and exclusive series and Chile originals. You can select and change the ambient sound in the background of the stories whenever you want to without affecting the story you're listening to, and we release hours of new stories every week. Click the link in the description down below to download and start your free trial to see if you like it. Also, Chilling's investment campaign is coming to a close very, very soon. So if you want to be a part of everything that we're currently building, Chilling, Chilling App, Chilling 2.0, Chilling Originals, and everything I just mentioned before, then you want to check the link in the description down below and check out the Chilling App. I also have a link to the Reliant campaign that's down there as well if you'd like to invest and become a part of everything that's currently growing. And now, on to tonight's story. I'm a car salesman. Not necessarily by choice. It's something that just kind of fell into place. I work at a local dealer near the mall in town, one my dad's been running ever since before I was born. And he loves cars. He loves to sell them. And I guess which sums up about why I work here. It's not a bad gig. Been doing it long enough to get pretty good at it. I had some pretty good sales in the past. Some felt a little scummier than others, but hey... It's the way that the trade works. I don't make much money if cars don't sell, so it's my best interest to do so. I was sitting at my desk when it started. It was a decent, but overall a slow day at work. The weather was nice, but I didn't get much of a chance to enjoy it because I hadn't had any sales all day, not one. No young couple looking for a cheap ride, no bachelor looking for a lifted truck or sports car, no family scouting a replacement minivan, nothing. So I spent most of the day at my desk, twiddling my thumbs, listening to the radio, eyeing the lot in case someone happened to wander over. I was ready to get a sale, be productive, instead of sitting around. My dad was out for the day, something about a golf outing with a competitor. He loved that stuff, since I... Since I had the building to myself, I was hoping to put in some decent numbers, but on this particular day, there was no one. I've had a lot on my mind recently, and the business would help clear the chaos in my head, so there I sat, dicking around as the hours crept by. That was until he showed up. I watched him arrive by bus, getting off the shuttle at the stop through the window. I had nothing going on, so I watched him after he showed up. He got off the bus, looked straight at the dealership, a slow, almost limp of a walk started as soon as he saw my building. My first thought of him was your stereotypical boomer dad. He had to be pushing 60. What was left of his wispy hair was gelled and combed across a colossal bald spot. His eyes were shielded by bronze aviator glasses, and his outfit looked like it was ripped straight from the 80s business catalog. Khakis, old leather shoes, a floral print button-up that barely contained a large beer belly, and a Navy members-only jacket to tie it all together. He had his hands stuffed in his pockets of his jacket. He was on a mission. While he drew closer to the dealer, I combed my hair, spit out my gum, straightened my tie. It was evident he was coming this way, but he was heading straight to the lot, probably to browse. I just took that as my cue to meet him. I pushed through the door and into the sunlight, feeling the breeze for the first time today. I was just standing there now, scanning. He didn't linger on anything very long. I would have to do some digging to get the sail moving. Uh, how are we doing today? I asked. Name's Mark. I'll be your liaison today. Something I can help you find? He just stood there, ignoring me for a second, looking at the cars at his own uninterrupted pace. With the aviators and the double chin, he looked like a grumpy frog. There was something unsettling about him from the get-go. I'm looking to buy a car, he said. Can't seem to find it. It's my third dealer today, he said plainly, very to the point. I clapped my hands together, ready to start the routine that I had done a hundred times. Well, this is your lucky day. We're currently having an abundance of... I'm not really here for the sales pitch, kid. He cut me off taking slow steps towards the shiny hatchbacks. <sighs> well, certainly there's some way I can help. I know all the makes and models in this lot. We have to be sitting on quite a bit. And let me tell you, 
Now is a great time to be on the market. I started turning around to face the luxury sedans. We're looking for something sleek for cruising, uh, maybe something a little sportier, but surely a old top like yourself would. I turned back to see that he was already walking away. I felt a twinge of frustration. I'd have to work a little harder to get this guy to play ball. I scratched my head and caught up with him, walking quicker so I could lead. The mini SUVs are one of the most popular items, plenty of room for passengers, cargo in the back. All-wheel drive, too. I can't recommend that enough. You know how winter can be around here, I said. The man just looked ahead, chewing his lip a little. The wind blew at his combed hair strands, but he didn't seem to mind it. Heated seats, Bluetooth, some of these even have TVs in them. They make the commute more enjoyable, satisfying. No interest in the first 12 months if you buy before the fall. We're at the tail end of our summer sale, but there's there's still some time. Even if you need time to think something over, I'll get you taken care of. Uh, what do you do for a living, if you don't mind me asking? He finally looked my direction, but his face was still blank, almost like stone. I was a car salesman. I'm retired now. He kept walking. You've got to be fucking kidding me, I thought to myself. This guy already knew the game. The tactics wouldn't work here. I'd have to follow him around like a lost dog and lap up whatever he fed if I wanted any kind of sale today. We could be here all day. He still might not get anything. I kept the enthusiasm going. You don't say. Anywhere around here? Maybe you know my father, I asked. The man had already stopped at our little cluster of trade-ins from past transaction. The man looked over them one by one, the sun shining in his sunglasses as he panned slowly like an owl. He came to an old Buick and stopped, fumbling in the pockets of his windbreaker. He pulled out a pack of cigarettes and a Zippo. Uh, uh, sir, I I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to put those away. We have a smoke-free premise, I said. He continued anyway. He leisurely fished a cigarette out of the pack and lit it, taking a big drag before pointing to the Buick. Little Sabre, give me the keys. He blew the smoke out at me and I waved it away. I looked at the car. A creeping anxiety washed over me. It was the 1998 Buick LeSabre Limited. Silver with tinted windows. This car, of all things, is this a game? Pardon? The trade-in? Are you sure you... We could find something better to suit you. Walk with me. There's quite a bit I could show you. What's the deal with the price? 8000 Blue books for five tops. I know you heard me. Get the fucking keys. He looked at me and took another drag. His tonal shift was alarming. I found myself glancing around. We were still alone. Uh, yeah, yes. Right away. Uh, let me get this for you. I briskly returned to the office for the key. I was sweating a little, trying to wrap my head around the old man's choice. The Sabre of all cars. I thought about calling my dad, but decided against it. He'd flip out, ask too many questions. I want to know every little detail about what was going on. When I came back, he was peering through the windows of the car. His cigarette snubbed down on the pavement. I wanted to scowl at it, but I kept cool. Still wanted to get something out of this guy. So I had to figure out how. Looks clean. Really clean, he said, as he peered through the driver's side window. They all are, I said, scratching the back of my head as I looked across the lot. The SUVs wouldn't do. It's too old for a really smart car. I had a feeling the digital stuff would scare him away. Maybe the Lincolns? The old man was looking at the paper that was taped to the inside of the windshield. The one below the large for sale sign. It displayed the mileage in terms of sale. As is, no warranty, stuff like that. It was a trade-in, after all. Well, let's take a look, shall we? He was leaning on the car now, waiting for me to unlock it. Sure thing, I smiled and worked the key inside the lock myself to make sure that nothing was amiss. The front seat floors were still covered with paper shields to ward off shoe scuffs, and the back seats were nice and clean, just as I hoped. Here she is, I reluctantly held the door for him, and he ducked his head in. It was hard to tell what he was thinking. Those damn sunglasses. Couldn't see anything behind him. 
He chewed his lip as he looked up and down the dash. Then his gaze held on the seats. They were tan leather, clean shine still catching the light. Leather seats, very clean. Back in my day, these used to drive the girls wild, he said under his breath. I started to feel uncomfortable. So many skirts in these back seats. He clicked his tongue and ran a finger down the clean leather. He looked at his fingertip and rubbed it against the thumb as if trying to feel dirt. Uh, yeah, is uh, that so? I played a long wiping sweat from my brow. Oh yeah, of course, he continued. You ever get a dame in the back seat of one of these, kid? He asked, a grin forming on his wrinkled, stubbled chin. He gave me the chills. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I gave him a nervous laugh. Say, a few rows down, we have the Lincoln Town Car. A few of them, actually, even in silver, too. Of course, he wasn't listening. With a labored wheeze, he leaned in and hit the button for the trunk. It was a soft click when the trunk popped open, and he immediately walked around me towards the rear of the car. He stood in front of the trunk with it cracked a little, as if he didn't want to open it. He ran his thumb over the paint, then over the temporary license plate. When his thumb reached the dealership sticker, he stopped for a moment. The sticker was the silhouette of a diamond. He looked at me, still frowning. There it is, namesake of the business. You know, diamond deals. My dad's idea. I still think it's pretty cheesy, if I'm being honest, I said, unable to shake the feeling of nervousness. The old man seemed taken aback. Yeah, there's that. He looked at the sign and lifted the lid of the trunk. As he stared in the trunk, I found myself following and looking as well. The same silent stare, the trunk was empty. There was a clear view to the little carpet hatch that led to the spare. The old man ran a finger over the carpet. Plenty of room in there, isn't it? He said. He was looking tired. Perhaps the sun was getting to him. Yeah, I suppose there is. Good going to town car, I guess. Plenty of room for groceries. Or a woman. He spoke. Stood the hair up in the back of my neck. S excuse me? I asked. You heard me? He looked at me, then slammed the trunk shut. It was loud and I jumped a little. Sir, uh. <laughs> I, I think it's time I asked you to leave, I stammered, feeling a ball in my throat. I instinctively felt for my phone, and the old man stared and scratched his stubbled chin. Leave. Who said I was leaving? I'm not finished here. He shoved past me and walked to the driver's side. He dug in his pocket again, this time pulling a half pint of whiskey. He twisted the cap and broke the seal before taking a swig. I could only watch in disbelief. Hey, I don't know what the hell you think you're doing, but it's time for you to go. I'm calling the police. I pulled out my phone while he screwed the cap back on. Don't worry, I'll call him, he said pocketing the whiskey and pulling out his flip phone. What? I yeah. asked. I said, I'll call him. Don't worry about it, kid. I'll handle it. He flipped his phone open and mulled it over in my head, sweating more and more as my confusion built. Wait, wait, wait. That, that's not necessary. We could figure something out, I'm sure. I put mine away and held my hands up. The old grumpy man looked at me, and after some time... His phone snapped shut. He dug out another cigarette and lit it. I scratched my sweaty head and looked around, but it was just us and the lot. When was the last time you drove this, kid? He asked. What? The Buick. You ever take her for a spin after hours when Daddy's not looking? He growled, his voice getting lower like he was whispering. What? No, no. I've never driven this car before, I told him. Huh, it's funny. All these cars in the lot, the only one without dust on the paint is this one. Still got shine on the tires. Why do you spray that on there? Pretty it up? Why do you do that if it's overpriced? You only pretty up the front liner, kid? It was moving closer. The cigarette smoke dancing on the wind. I told you, I haven't driven this car. Only run the lot like the others. Another thing, kid. The paper on the window says it's got 130,715 miles. Yeah, and? Dash says 74.7. Ticking to the swig. What? 
the Carfax is off then. This is, that's 32 miles. Who gives a shit? I'll, I'll print out a new one. I told you, the cars get moved around. Yeah, maybe a block or so. Unless there's a maintenance issue. You know what? There's a couple of bars in town, only a few miles away. You ever take her out for a spin, kid, clean her up, impress the girls? Just taking another drink. My hands are starting to shake. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you don't. Let me tell you a story, kid, real quick. Like I said, I was a salesman too. I get it. I was a damn good one. But I tell you what else. I was a total piece of shit husband. And a worse father. I didn't give a damn about my kid. Not really. They were just things that happened. Cars, on the other hand. I lived for those cars. Oh, that's what I loved. I got divorced a long time ago. Me and the wife never talk. My daughter. She must be a little younger than you. He said. He was talking much faster, raising his voice. Anyway, my ex calls me yesterday. We haven't spoken in years. Tells me our kid hasn't come home. She thinks she's missing. Said she called the cops. They didn't do shit. As far as I know. Yeah? So what? What's that got to do with me, huh? I was getting loud. My voice echoing in the lot. You feel the anxiety setting in. Thing is, the date picked her up that night. Like a gentleman. Car all done up, spick and span, for the last time she saw her. Said he was driving an old silver Buick. Said there was a sticker on the bumper, like a symbol. She wasn't sure it was dark out. But as it turns out, on the third dealer, I found it. I looked at the large spinning sign. The glittering letters. Diamond deals. I couldn't breathe. So I think it's time to come clean. Take a last drag and snub it out. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do. Maybe your daddy ain't quite figured it out, but he will. He know you marked the price up on that car? To keep the eyes off of it? Fuck you. I clenched my fist. Sure. You only put a couple of miles on. Bar's not that far. But I tell you what, you know what else isn't far away? The river. You'd be there in ten minutes. So what happened, kid? You push her too far. She reject you? You're wrong. I said, tears welling in my eyes. No, I'm not. The car is probably the cleanest in the lot. It's been vacuumed at least three times and the outside's shiny and new. You don't wash the trade-ins, kid. They're not worth the effort. How long till daddy finds out? You think you'll like that? You messing up that bad? It was an accident. Bad like yourself. Maybe not used to hearing the word no. To you hurt your feelings. Take you down a peg. Big man like yourself. I told you it was an accident. I felt my knees buckling. Suddenly it was hard to stand. Sure, kid. And I cut to the chase. I'm calling the police either way. Either now or when I'm on the way home on the next bus. They'll take everything I know. They'll find her wherever she is. But it ain't going to be quick. They'll drag you and your father through the mud through the whole process. You'll be finished, he said. My legs can no longer hold the weight of the stress and guilt. I started sobbing, burying my face in my hands. What do you want me to do? I can't undo what I've done. At some point, he was standing next to me getting one last thing from his pockets. Through his tears and shame, I could see the pistol. A little thirty-eight snub nose. I won't lie and tell you I was there for my daughter growing up. I wasn't. I know that. But she's still my daughter. I'm just doing what's right. It's the least I can do. But I'm no killer. You want to know what I want you to do? Atone for your mistakes. Make sure it doesn't happen again. Seems like a better alternative to carry the weight and rotting in prison, don't it? Either way, it's up to you. I did my part. He said this as he held out the gun. I took it. Cradled it in my trembling hands. 
The old man sighed, retrieved the whiskey, and downed it in a large gulp. He winched behind his glasses, and there was the glimmer of a tear behind the lens. He tossed the bottle into the parking lot and walked away, lighting a cigarette without another word. Through puffy eyes, I watched him go, the same limp taking him to the bus stop he arrived on. Without as much as a look back, he sat on the bench and waited for the next shuttle. I climbed to my feet and went back to the office. I collected my things, locked up for the day, closing the dealership early. When I came back out, he was gone. The bus bench was empty, like he was never even here. The pistol in my pocket and the booze bottle in the parking lot reminded me of his visit, almost assuring me of what had to be done next. I got in the Buick. I drove home. It took me some time to process it all, but by the time I got home, I knew what I had to do. I sat down, wrote this, hopefully to clear up any questions for those that come looking for me. I know I'm a piece of shit. I did what I did. There's nothing I can do to fix that now. I'm sorry. Really. I was in denial at first. I tried my best to cover it up because I was scared. Scared of what I did and the repercussions that now follow if it was discovered. I got a bunch of missed calls on my phone now. Too many to go through. And to be honest, there's no need. I made my decision. There's a little bar on the outskirts of town called the Six Shot. Little red neon sign. If you head east for eight miles or so, there's a small bridge with a river running underneath it. She's under the bridge. I tried to use some rocks to weigh her down. I hope she's still there. I'm sorry. She deserved much better. Uh, that's it. That's about all I have to say. I've learned from my mistake. I won't hurt anybody again. I got the pistol on the desk now, and once I post this, once I post it, I'm going to take the deal the old man gave me. At least that way I can try and set things right. He did say one thing. He was a damn good salesman. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we say goodnight, I just want to let you know that the author of tonight's story has a book that is currently available, and if you enjoyed tonight's story, I strongly encourage you to check out the book, Lying Awake, a horror anthology, written by Jesse Pullins. Link in the description down below. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on you guys are the ones who are keeping me sane and I mean that with all sincerity that you guys have helped me immensely so in my personal life and my professional life I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Jeff Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pedasqueezer, Gaddis, Joseph Calarudo, Woody B, Dante Kincaid, Town 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Amber Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Estabine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goring Trimagasy, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Inchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80's Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, 
Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Vester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, the Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Tension. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here or down there or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night and sweet dreams. This all happened about five years ago. Still, the memory, the memory of it lingers and the nightmares persist. The details of everything are so clear in my mind, right? The sights, the smells, the feeling of my pounding heart as I run for my life, terrified. I've never spoken about this to anyone until now. Here goes. The Pacific Ocean was at my back, and the sound of crashing waves could be heard receding behind me as I trudged along the uphill path of the trees. The air smelled like salt water, kelp, and pine needles. You're not gonna believe this place, Gilbert said, walking a few paces ahead of me, up the trail. He was wearing a well-worn fisherman's overalls, thick rubber boots, which went up to his thighs. I don't want to oversell it, but I promise... You won't see anything like this again in your life. I didn't realize at the time what he meant by that, but I'd find out soon enough. When we came into the clearing, I saw a beautiful freshwater bay. The lake was clear and aqua blue, peaceful, utterly silent, aside from our echoing voices and occasional call of birds in the distance. A bald eagle was perched on a nearby tree, watching us from above. Mountains stood on the horizon, their peaks haloed with mist, making the place look picturesque and stunning. My trip to British Columbia had revealed many of the most beautiful views I'd ever seen, and this one topped them all. It's beautiful, I said to Gilbert, awestruck. I can't believe how clear the water is, and how blue. It really is amazing. You see all those cottages over there? He asked in his thick accent. I looked around and saw several of the waterside houses, although I wouldn't call these monstrosities cottages. I mean, they were more like mansions. Most were well hidden amongst the trees despite their size with impressive decks and landscaping. Large boats sat in the water, bobbing up and down in the waves. Wow, the people on this lake must be rich. I thought you were all alone here, so far out in the middle of nowhere. Gilbert was a former chef who lived in a float house in an ocean harbor, which was only accessible by boat and prop plane. It took us three hours to get there on his boat the day prior, but it had been worth it. He had an incredible setup that allowed him to live almost entirely self-sustainably, with prawn traps set up everywhere, oysters galore, and some of the best fishing I'd ever seen. It was a seafood lover's paradise. He even went scuba diving for scallops, but this lake... This lake was the hidden jewel of his location, he said. These are summer homes, where a lot of wealthy politicians, celebrities, not like, actually. Believe it or not, they're empty 90% of the time. And every once in a while, someone drops in by prop plane or helicopter, spends a week on the lake. It's the off-season, though, so nobody's out here right now. I'm taking care of all the properties on the lake, and anybody who comes in calls ahead so I can get it ready for them. Stocking the place with firewood, making sure the gas is on, you know, whatever needs to be done. And let out a soft whistle. That meant he had access to every one of these huge mansions, and basically had free reign of their amenities for the majority of the year. This place is something else. The lake was one of the most beautiful I'd ever seen, and I could understand why rich people would flock to it from afar. Mist was rising off the surface of the water, and despite the gray, overcast day, I was excited by the location, which was so unlike any I'd ever seen. It looked like it was a picture from a calendar or a screensaver. Just wait until you see the fishing, he told me with a smile. We got into a small aluminum boat, and he pulled the cord on the outboard motor. It rumbled to life, and he began to steer us out into the heart of the lake. It was larger than I expected extending several kilometers into the distance. There were also islands in the middle of the water, which had a couple different summer homes built on them. 
I asked Gilbert who the houses belonged to, but the motor was roaring so loud he didn't hear me. Or pretended like he didn't. He slowed down at a strange place in the water. I realized as we were getting closer there was something off about it. The water was bubbling and moving as if being disturbed from underneath. A stretch of about 50 square yards was all affected in the same way. See that? Gilbert asked, pointing at the section of the water with a strange disturbance. Yeah, what is it? It looks like the water's boiling. That's what we came out here for, he said, pulling out his fishing rod. That's what I call a trout feeding frenzy. He handed me a line, and I was about to cast it out, but then noticed there was no bait on it. Uh, can I get a worm or something? I said. He just shook his head, smiling, and motioned for me to put the line out in the water. There was an immediate hit, and I began to fight with a fish that had been hooked. Well, you don't even need bait! I reeled it in, one after another, until we had more than enough for dinner. He told me that it was like this all the time on the lake. The best freshwater fishing location he'd ever seen in his life. And it was full of rainbow trout as well, which made it all the better. The rich people who come out here used to pay to have the lake stocked with rainbow trout, but nobody really fished it but me. They got a bit out of control. There's a multitude of them now. You'd think that fishing without any challenge would get boring fast, but it doesn't. Still, there's only so many you can catch before you get tired start to feel like there's no possible way you could ever eat so many. Gilbert reassured me, saying that he canned whatever excess he caught. We were about to turn back when I looked out over a nearby island. To my surprise, I saw something looking back at me. I gasped in surprise at the strange sight. There was a massive owl head poking out of the trees, staring at me, unmoving. I actually screamed when I saw it, and Gilbert followed my gaze and turned to look as well. What the hell? What is that thing? Is it real? It was terrifying, whatever it was. The face was staring at us with a lifelike expression. It's not moving. Is it a statue? How have you never noticed it before? I asked. Aren't you out here all the time? He shook his head. I don't remember ever seeing that before. Whatever it is, it's big. It's gotta be 50 feet tall. Gilbert started the engine. Let's go take a look. Maybe it's an old indigenous statue or something like that. I hesitated. I I felt slightly irked for some reason. Okay, but just let's turn around if anything feels off, okay? Unsure what exactly I was scared of, we began heading towards the island. The small outboard motor kicking up a cool mist which splashed my face and wet my hands. My heart started pounding faster in my chest and my throat as we neared the strange pair of eyes overlooking the top of the tree line. Eventually it disappeared into the boughs of trees, and again I was left with the eerie afterimage of it in my mind. It was eyes, staring menacingly outward, a face too large to be real. As we came close to the shoreline I realized how completely alone I was. Gilbert seemed nice enough, but I barely knew him. I had met him through my cousin who I was visiting and who I had flown across the country to see. She had arranged for me to stay with him in his floating house on a whim, since she was called into work last minute and he was in town on a supply run. She told me it'd be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Of course, now I was wondering how well she actually knew Gilbert. As it would turn out, not very well at all. Something about this didn't feel right, I was slowly realizing. Something about Gilbert overall. The vibe was making me uneasy as he helped me off the boat just a little too eagerly. There used to be tribes of indigenous people who lived off the land, fished in the region. Bet it's an old totem pole or something like that. This could be a huge discovery, good eye noticing it. The noise of the engine was gone now, and we were left in complete silence again as he tried to lead me away from the boat towards what appeared to be a path in the forest. Hey, maybe... Maybe... Can we go back? I'm not feeling well, I lied. My stomach's upset. Don't be silly. Come on. It'll just take a minute. Looks like it was just up the hill here. I tried to shake off the feeling of paranoia, and I half succeeded, then began to follow after him. I looked back over my shoulder at the boat and thought that I could always run back to it and use it to escape if I needed to. 
This path looks pretty well worn, I said, catching up to him. Maybe the folks who lived in those summer houses know something about the statue. Yeah, that could be. I'll have to call up a couple people and see if we're the only ones who have found this place. It's pretty visible from the water. Maybe just from that one angle. That one spot that you chose to fish, I thought, but didn't say. We came over a ridge, and sure enough, there it was again. Only this time, we could see the whole thing. Up ahead of us in a clearing was a massive, towering statue of an owl. It had been at least 50 feet tall, maybe more. It was difficult to judge, but this was no totem pole. It was wide as a house at its base, standing imposing and possibly way out here in the middle of nowhere. At the base of this huge, terrifying owl statue was what appeared to be a dazed pulpit pews at an altar off to the side of the lectern. That was when I noticed that there were people watching us from near the statue, their clothes blending in with the bark of the trees. I saw several figures in brown hooded robes, their faces shrouded in darkness, moving slowly, deliberately. They produced long, sickle-shaped knives from deep pockets that they had and began to march toward me. I looked, horrified, towards Gilbert's face. He was wearing a knowing look saying that I had been right not to trust him. He didn't appear surprised to see any of this, and he didn't even bother to try to stop me when I ran, screaming. Instead, his head just turned on a slow swivel, watching me go. I turned and bolted back towards the motorboat. My shoes crunched the dry leaves and pine needles beneath my feet. I nearly slipped in a mud puddle as I sprinted as fast as I could, too terrified to look back and see if Gilbert was chasing me. I just assumed that he was. But by the time I got to the boat and ventured to look back, I realized he wasn't close behind me. However, that didn't mean he wasn't still following me and hiding in the trees. I tried to start the engine and realized why he hadn't bothered to put much effort into stopping me. The outboard motor's pull cord was missing. Without it, there was no way to start the engine. Gilbert, the sly bastard, customized the motor with a clip-on starter, one that he could easily remove without it being noticed. There was no oars in the boat either, which meant that I was stuck. I was stuck unless, of course, I could swim across the lake, which I didn't think I was capable of. I'm not a strong swimmer by any stretch, and it was at least a kilometer to the other side, if not more. The sun was beginning to set, I noticed, and I looked around the lake to see if there was some other way to escape. That was when I saw all the figures standing out on the shoreline across the water. In front of each of the summer houses, there was a dark silhouette looking out at me across the lake. Dozens of them were staring at me in the waning lights of the evening. The sounds of motorboats being started up at the same time echoed across the still surface of the lake, and each of them moved in unison towards the vessel. I knew without a second thought, whoever those people were, they were coming for me. That altar beneath the giant owl statue, that was meant for me. I was going to be their sacrifice. You picked the wrong week to come visit. Sorry, Gilbert said behind me in his thick accent. Once a year they all come here for their meeting. I get a bonus if I could find someone for their ceremony. Your cousin didn't know, to her credit. I have to tell her there was a boating accident, you know, something like that. The chubby red-haired man in overalls laughed, his gut bouncing up and down. He didn't look the least bit sorry. A moment later, they arrived. I saw at least a dozen at first, maybe more. They pulled their boats into the shallows around the island and got out in their hip waders, similar to what Gilbert was wearing. I couldn't believe the faces of the ultra-famous people who came towards me from the water's edge. Celebrities, politicians, musicians, and pundits. People you wouldn't believe if I told you. All of them in brown hooded robes. I turned and I ran, dodging Gilbert's grasp as he reached out to stop me. You won't get away! He called after me, cackling. They're all over the island by now. There's nowhere to run. Ignoring him, I raced down the path towards the woods. Stumbling, I landed in a puddle of mud with leaves floating in it, and I pulled myself up quickly, continuing back towards the other end of the island, towards more certain death. I didn't know what I had hoped to achieve. Gilbert was right. I was doomed. Looking back, I saw the group was not too far behind. Running up the steep hill, I hoped maybe I could lose them once I reached the top by veering off into the trees for cover. That would have been my only hope. 
darkness was settling on the island. It was becoming more difficult to see my way as I tripped over roots and ruts in the ground. And finally, I reached the top of the hill. I immediately ducked into the trees to the right, hoping to lose them in the twilight darkness of the trees. The sounds of voices running after me made me run faster than I should have, and I suddenly found myself tumbling upon the edge of a precipice, one I hadn't noticed up ahead. I landed hard, hitting my head on a rock instantly. Everything went black. I woke up tied to a slab of rock cold beneath my back. My wrists and ankles were bound tightly, and I couldn't move as someone spoke loudly nearby sounding as if they were mid-sermon, speaking some dark prayer in a demented church service. Craning my aching head upwards, I looked around to see I was now directly beneath the giant owl statue, tied to the altar which I was laid out on top of. A man with a brown robe was speaking loudly to the assembled crowd, watching from the woods. Every audience member held a torch which flickered and cast them in a warm glow. Through the trees I saw the moon hovering just above the horizon, bloated and crimson. The priest, who had been speaking to the crowd, finished his dark sermon, and the congregation began to cluck their tongues in response. It was the most unsettling thing I'd ever heard. There were hundreds of them, all watching me, clutching their tongues inhumanly as they held candles and observed the priest. Sweat was pouring from my brow and into my eyes as I darted my gaze around the forest, looking for any possible way to escape. I pulled on the bonds holding me to test them. They were fastened tightly in place. Disciples of Moloch have gathered here under the blood moon to give a sanguine sacrifice to him. May our offering please him and give us favor in his eyes. The crowd responded, chanting something in reply, which was indiscernible since their muttering voices all mingled together. I realized they were ramping up to kill me, and if I was going to escape, it would have to be soon. All eyes were still focused on the priest on the days, and this would be my only chance to get away. I felt something tugging at the ropes of my wrist, and I heard a sound coming from behind me. I realized it was the sound of a saw cutting through the binds. Stay still. Act like I'm not here, the voice said from behind me. If they catch me, they'll kill us both. Despite the man's words, I couldn't help looking back and seeing his face. He was wearing a brown robe like the others. You one of them? I asked. Why are you helping me? I'm not really one of them, he said, finishing with the rope in my right hand and moving on to the other. I'm a reporter. I've been working for years to infiltrate this place and finally did. I was filming the whole ceremony, but I had to stop to save you. I just couldn't let them kill you. Thank you, I said. Overwhelmed with relief. Really, I mean it. I'll pay you back for this somehow. Once we get out of here. If we get out of here, he said. Finishing, cutting the bond, holding my wrist. Okay. Here's the tricky part, the voice said from the shadows beyond the altar. As soon as we start cutting those ropes on your legs, you're going to see us doing it. I realized he was right. From the dark place beneath me, he had cut the ropes holding my wrists. My feet were facing the crowd. Everyone would see him. If he ventured to the front of the altar to cut those ropes. So what do we do? An explosion suddenly boomed in the distance, and the orange glow of a fireball bursting into the air caught everyone's attention. We'll need a distraction, he said, moving down to my legs, sticking close to the altar to avoid detection. Like that one. And try to get the rope free from your other leg quick. I sat up and started working on the ropes, finding them tied tight in knots like I'd never seen. Luckily, the whole audience and the priests at the front were all still distracted by the giant cloud of smoke rising in the distance. The last thing people like these wanted was to be seen, and even as far from civilization as we were, an explosion like that could attract attention. The priest was shouting at his acolyte to find out who was responsible for the blast, but suddenly someone noticed. A voice began to shout from the audience, Someone's trying to free the sacrifice! A traitor! Murmuring and cries out of the outrage rang through the trees, and suddenly the huge crowd of people were racing down towards us through the woods like an evil mob, torches in hand. The priest turned from his place on the stage and pulled out a long knife from its sheath around his waist. He walked in our direction just as the ropes gave way, and I rolled off the side of the altar. Run! shouted the man who had cut me loose. He bolted off through the trees, and I followed after him. 
He ran through the trees toward the shoreline where a boat was waiting, already running. Another figure could be seen moving along the shore towards the boat, and I realized they looked familiar. As we got closer, I saw it was my cousin. It was her who had set off the explosion. Grace? What the hell were you doing here? There's no time. Get in the boat! We all jumped in, and she started the boat off towards the other end of the lake. I was surprised to see nobody following after us, but we managed to get to the ocean before anyone found us. It turned out Grace had sabotaged the expensive boats, which would have easily outrun us, as well as blown up the larger vessel with a homemade bomb. The hell was that? I asked my cousin as we were safely away from the cemetery. How could you leave me with that maniac? It turned out Gilbert and the cult who tried to kill me weren't the only monsters that day. My own cousin set me up just for a story. She knew what had happened on the lake and used me as bait to see if they really could go through with killing a human sacrifice. If it hadn't been for her partner, I would have died. But he couldn't go through with it. I live in fear now. Wondering when exactly the powerful people who tried to kill me would come to find me. I'm sure it wouldn't take long once they find this. After all, I saw their faces. I know what all of them are capable of. They like to live in the shadows. They don't want you to know what they do when you're not watching. But I... I've seen everything. There once was a man with ears, you see. In the dead of night, he'll come for thee. He'll drag you into the woods to scream, and there your bones he'll gnaw. Soon shall the bunny man come to take you away from your dad and mom. Soon shall the bunny man come, and your soul shall belong to him. Catherine, stop! I hated when she'd sing that song. I still remember my sister's face when I would beg her to stop because of that ghoulish smile she wore when she was tormenting me. We grew up in New Zealand, so the shanty was something old that we changed for our own purposes. Many of the kids sang it, but my sister, my sister was the first to adopt it into something different from its original. A few kids had added some creative lyrics to the original, usually something about, like, fart men or something. But Catherine, however, Catherine had turned it into a song about the bunny man. The teachers forbade her from singing it at school and took it as a challenge to sing it at every opportunity. It was usually sung low or under her breath, so my parents couldn't hear it, so she could deny it when I went to them crying about it. I mean, it was in poor taste anyway. The bunny man may have been an urban legend, but the man kidnapped children, and he was... It's very real. That summer, 13 children had gone missing in our city. All of them were from poor families like ours who lived in tenement buildings like ours. They always disappeared in the middle of the night after being lulled out of their home. The same sign was always left behind, whether it was a spray paint on the door or the fence behind their house or the side of the building they lived in. The calling card was always left in plain white spray paint for the people to find. A white rabbit head in a white circle became the sign of the bunny man. My sister had started humming the little shanty after the seventh kid had gone missing. I had heard her in her room, working through the lyrics as she did her homework. As she scratched away at math problems, she would hum the lyrics to herself in that distracted way that people do when trying to figure out something. She would argue with herself as she worked, making corrections to the grisly shanty she was constructing. I would shudder as I heard what she was writing, but I knew that it would do no good to try to stop her. I saw her smile a few times as she noticed my discomfort, and I think... I think I became her barometer in some matters. The more I shuddered, the more lyrics I heard that stayed in place. By the time school started in August, her shanty had taken form, and she began her reign of terror. Catherine and I were two years apart. I had started sixth grade when she had started eight, and she seemed to delight in terrorizing the other girls in my class with her bunny man song. She would walk behind groups of students humming the tune at first, and they walked to class or lunch. And then she would begin to sing the words to herself, low at first, building volume. She would keep building until a few of them started to hear what she was singing, becoming noticeably upset and nervous. Then she would run up behind the group, caterwauling the last verse as she sent them screaming and running in all directions. 
and that's how she had earned herself a suspension from school and a grounding by her parents. And that's why she was home that night. The night the bunny man did indeed come. We were both grounded that night, actually. My sister was grounded after being suspended from school for her bunny man shenanigans, and she didn't much care. She was happy to put off her schoolwork, watch TV all day, suffer the wrath of our parents. I, however, was grounded for encouraging these antics by saying I had seen the bunny man. Now, it wasn't a joke, though. I wasn't trying to encourage Catherine and her bad behavior. I had woken up for six nights in a row hearing someone humming that shanty and going to the window to see who it was. I couldn't actually hear anyone, I realize now. Our loft was on the fifth floor, looking out of the vacant lot and road behind the building. There was no way I should have been able to hear anything. I, I could, though. I could clearly remember hearing the shanty hummed in a gravelly baritone that sounded as though it was right outside my window. first few times I heard it, I went to the window and looked out into the lot. In the moonlight, I could see him standing in the road. A man in a dingy gray rabbit suit. His eyes glowing yellow and ears cocked almost jauntily. My parents would hear me screaming and they would come running in my room to see what was going on and they would... They'd find me on the floor screaming, pointing out the window, always gibbering about the bunny man. But after the third night, I didn't even go to the window. I would lay in bed and sob as the shanty bore into my brain. I would sob and call for them screaming about the damn bunny man until finally... Well, finally, my father couldn't take it anymore. And that's why both of us were grounded on the night in question. And our parents were out. It was supposed to be a family night. You know, we were supposed to go out, have a meal as a family, see a movie... Maybe get ice cream? Instead, my father used it as a punishment for my sister after she'd gotten in trouble. We three would go out and have fun while she stayed at home and did not. My mother, however, thought it was a little harsh. And she had been pleading with him to reconsider all week. This had made him a little short, and after being woken up by my screaming all week, he had reached his limit. He also grounded me, thinking I was trying to egg my sister on with all this bunny man nonsense, and announced that he and my mother would be going on a date instead. We'll be back by 10. You two to be in bed by 8.30. You'll be severely punished if I come in and you're still awake. Then they had left. We'd gotten along pretty well for a few hours. Catherine made dinner, heating up some canned pasta in the microwave. And we watched TV as the sun set and the evening wore on. It wasn't until 8 when I got off the couch and started for bed. She started in her old ways. She asked what I was doing, and when I told her I was going to get ready for bed, she asked why. You heard that. If we're still up when he gets here, we'll be in trouble. <sighs> Probably. I'll be just scared of the bunny man, and afraid that he'll hear that you're awake and come get you. I'm not. I lied. R2, you're in such a hurry to go to sleep, so the bunny man will come and peek at you while you're asleep. Cut it out, Catherine. She leaned towards me, grinning that awful grin. Oh, there... Once was a man with ears, you see. I put my hands over my ears and started running away as she sang all the louder and chased me. In the dead of night, he'll come for thee. Stop it, Catherine! I sobbed. We were running up the hall, and as I wheeled into my room, I tried to slam the door and lock her out. She battered the door aside and bore down on me, grinning and singing as I cowered beneath the window. I covered my ears with my arms, sobbing uncontrollably as I tried to block her out. She, she stalked towards me, bellowing the song now, and... "'Strinching her hands like claws as she walked towards me. "'Soon shall the bunny man come to—' "'But she stopped suddenly. "'And as the silence stretched on, I opened my eyes "'and I looked up to find her looking out the window as she loomed over me. "'She was staring at the window, transfixed by whatever she saw out there. "'And this new game almost scarier than the shanty. "'Her face held a look that I was unused to seeing.' She was startled, unsure of what she was seeing. But it also appeared that there was terror there. Something outside the window had really spooked her, and I scrambled up to peek under her arm so I could see too. It seemed I was peeking at one of my nightmares. Standing in the road right under a streetlight, 
was a man in a tattered gray bunny costume. It wasn't like a Halloween costume, some of which looked more like pajamas than a costume. It, it was a full suit of coarse-looking gray fur. The fur was matted and dark in places. The fur kinked and tangled like a stuffed animal that needed to be brushed. The head was obscured by a black hood, some kind of costume hood that just slid over the head, and the face was a flat black nothing as it stared at our building. Not at our building. At, at us. On top of the head, someone had stapled a pair of thin, emaciated gray rabbit ears, one of which bent at an almost jaunty angle. He stood on the street and stared up at us, my sister and I frozen in terror at the sight of the legendary bunny man. All at once I heard a gruff, tuneless humming from the street that sounded startling like Catherine's shanty. He had no words to go along with it, he only hummed and stared, and I think we both felt an almost magnetic desire to stare back at him. He was like the scene in a scary movie where the monster is out in the open and you pray that none of the characters are stupid enough to confront him. In your heart, though, you know one of them is. Catherine. Catherine appeared to be that one. I caught her by the arm and she turned from the window. She looked back at me, her face full of confused anger and unsure deliberation. She was clearly at odds with herself, and my sister was not someone who was used to being unsure of her actions. She was a brat and a terror, but I had always believed that everything she did was calculated, a course of risk and rewards. This was something else, though. This was her acting against her will. After all, she had sung about the bunny man coming for others. It appeared to be her that he had come for this time. She jerked her hand away and left my room. When I heard the front door open and closed, I moved back to the windows, waiting for her to appear. The bunny man went right on humming and watching, as though he were trying to call me as well. I felt the pull, but my face kept me rooted to the spot. I clutched the window sill tightly, the paint chipping a little as my fingers gripped it, and I would find splinters under my nails the next day, though I didn't notice the rest of that night. Then she appeared in the backyard, walking like a sleepwalker, and going to him as he vaulted the chain-link fence between the yard and the road. He reached for her hand, and now I could see them humming, humming that hateful song and staring up at me. It filled my head like a hive of bees, and I knelt against the glass as I prayed that it would stop. There'd be no way I could resist if they both sang, and I could feel the pull as they tried to drag me out of the door as well. After about sixty seconds of them humming and staring, the two of them turned and disappeared up the road. My parents came home three hours later to find me curled up on the bedroom floor, sobbing and gibbering about the bunny man. They immediately searched the house, thinking that my sister had gone too far. Catherine had finally scared me too much, and now she would have to answer for it. And as my mother sat with me, trying to console me, my father tore up the house, looking for her. He clearly expected her to be hiding somewhere inside, probably running to hide when she heard the front door open. And when he couldn't find her inside, he looked for her at her friends' houses. And their parents told him, often grumpily, that they hadn't seen Catherine. But they would call him if they did. He got worried then going to look up and down the street for her. He expected her to have hidden somewhere in fear of retribution, but the longer he didn't find her, the more worried he became. Mom tried to calm me down, and Dad searched, wanting to get a straight answer out of me. After about an hour, I started talking about the bunny man, how he had come to get us, and how Catherine had left with him. She... She started to get angry, telling me that she... She was tired of hearing about the damn bunny man. However... However, when I refused to deviate from my story, she started to take me a little more seriously. The police were called. The neighborhood was searched. People were questioned. The woods were calm for the next week and a half. No signs were ever found of my sister or the bunny man. No signs were ever found of any of the children abducted by the bunny man that year. And that was 15 years ago. The bunny man took only one more child that year, a seven-year-old girl taken on Christmas Eve. After that, the bunny man was never seen again. 
They never found the remains of any of the kids he kidnapped. No one was ever arrested in connection with the kidnappers. There was never any bunny suit found or a murder weapon discovered in the woods. Whoever was doing these things just stopped. I'm 27 now. My own daughter's eight. Her dad's not really in the picture, which leaves a lot of time for just us. One night I was getting ready for bed, Emily playing in her room before bedtime, when I heard something that made me stop in my tracks. The tune. A familiar tune that everyone in my house knew crept up the hallway. The tune wasn't what stopped me, it was the lyrics that made me shiver. The words she sang transported me back in time and suddenly, suddenly I was 12 years old and I was watching my older sister creep towards me as she sang those hateful words. However, the voice that sang them was childish. Lilting words no more care than she would have for any nursery rhyme. There once was a man with ears, you see. In the dead of night, he'll come for thee. He'll drag you into the woods to scream. And there he'll gnaw your bones. Yeah, I know. Who in their right minds uses TikTok? I was already starkly opposed to social media, especially TikTok. That cesspit of stupidity and regurgitated jokes should have never become a thing, and not one as huge as it is today. I wish I'd never downloaded the damn thing. I, I really wish. Or maybe... Maybe I do after all. Well, never mind. One day, I was bored. After my computer broke, all I had was my phone. I was never a book guy. Even hell, I didn't even own any mobile games. They're nothing that can entertain me so much. So, one day I give in, right? I download TikTok as my Play Store has recommended so many times. At first, I was annoyed. I was more than annoyed. All I found were short clips of people acting like idiots. After a while, though, I found the occasional interesting piece of content, like little life hacks, for example. The videos on how to survive in the wild, do-it-yourself guides, or how to prepare hot meals without using a stove. It, I was always intrigued by these things. Needless to say, I got hooked. For the past weeks, however, I got interested in a different type of content. Urban exploring. The real deal, I mean, not, not the bullshit where there's a creator's friend who's covering it in a bed sheet and it pretends to be a ghost in a dark hallway. No, I'm... I like to watch people explore old mine shafts, abandoned buildings, ghost towns. It was fun for a while. I didn't like the fact that I'd never be able to visit any of the places I saw. After getting acquainted with the shit show that was TikTok search, I began browsing hashtag after hashtag. Eventually, I found a new local content creator who explored abandoned places in my area. Now, my city isn't huge, but it isn't small either, so there's quite a bit of content. Occasionally, I'd even watch a live stream. There was something exhilarating, you know, about urban exploring. Before long, I put together my own list of places I wanted to see. If I ever left the house, that is, and if I ever was man enough to do so. Tonight, I was notified about another live stream. It was by two guys I'd recently discovered. Most of their content was typical for TikTok, stuff I didn't care about. Sometimes, however... They checked out abandoned places. I joined the live stream and I heard that they were on their way to one of the notorious abandoned areas of my city. Yeah, bro. This place used to be like hot shit back in the day. Like everybody wanted to live out here. No way, dude. You're fucking with me. That tower block over there, it's going to collapse any minute now. I swear, man. But it was like decades ago. I heard they even wanted to renovate the place at one point, but never did. Yeah? Why didn't they? No clue. Place is a money sink, I guess. But they realized it's all old shit. Yeah, like the rest of this city. Both of them began guffawing, and I couldn't help but frown. They seemed to talk in the typical, annoying, over-the-top way all influencers did these days. I hated it. Before long, however, they reached a giant old apartment complex. But for a while, they continued on down a small, deserted street. 
And then they followed an alley that led them right to the center of the complex. The entire place was ruined. What might have been in a nice little park was now completely overgrown. Rubble was everywhere, and here and there I saw stacks of old, half-rotten construction materials. Hey man, did you hear that? It's like crying or something, one of them said suddenly. His friend's face appeared in front of the camera. An anxious look washed over it. Then he began laughing. Fuck, bro, you almost got me. By now, both of them were laughing again like the idiots they were. I wasn't. God, these guys were annoying. With a sigh, I put the phone down, ignoring their annoying voices, and I couldn't help but stare at the empty wall in front of me. What the hell was I even doing? How the fuck was I watching some teenager's stupid TikTok livestream in the middle of the night? While I questioned my life choices, a flashlight beam reached me from outside. In an instant, I got up and went towards my balcony door. Having a ground floor apartment always seems to make me uneasy. The area I lived in wasn't a bad one, but it's not exactly a good one either. Never knew what could happen. One of my biggest fears was to find someone trying to climb onto my balcony and break into my place. I took a deep breath. It was probably just someone's phone. I pushed aside the curtain, trying my best to stay hidden. Right outside in front of my building, I saw two figures. Each one was holding a flashlight in their hands, blasting their beams over apartments and windows alike. What the hell were they doing? Didn't they know people were trying to sleep? Once more, one of them sent their beams straight into my apartment, illuminating my living room. Assholes. But they're trying to fuck with people. From outside, I could hear their laughter and the high-pitched teenage voices. Got nothing better to do, huh? Growing angry, I pushed open the balcony door to tell them to fuck off. And right when I stepped outside, one of them was actually trying to climb onto my balcony. For a moment, the beam of flashlight hit me right in the face. What the fuck? I screamed while I instinctively shielded my eyes from the blinding light. Screaming in surprise, the guys tumbled backward and crashed down over the balcony railing. In an instant, I was back inside, throwing the balcony door shut. That was it. Now I was pissed. Fucking around with flashlights was one thing, but trying to break into my place was a whole different story. I put on my shoes, threw on my jacket, and stormed outside. Before I did, I got a hold of a broom, you know, just in case, I told myself. When I pushed open the apartment building door, I saw they were right there. One of them was on the ground, probably hurt from tumbling down while his friend was trying to help him up. The moment they saw me, they froze. What the hell do you think you're doing? I screamed at them. In my anger, I began waving around the broom, hoping to show them that I was serious. No, we did nothing. I swear. We, we didn't know that someone lived here, so we're sorry. We're sorry. One of them called out to me. By now, the one on the ground had gotten back to his feet. Get the hell out of here. I spat at them, taking a single well-measured step forward. By now, both of them were shaking. They were pleading with me, crying, repeating, we're sorry, as they backed away. As I stood there watching them, their entire situation felt weird. Why the hell were they suddenly so scared? I mean, just moments ago, they tried to climb onto someone's balcony, and, and now my anger evaporated. I almost felt sorry for them. Almost. Still, I lowered the broom and tried to look as non-threatening as possible. Yo, yo, I won't do anything to you guys, all right? Just leave. They were still scared, but nodded vehemently, promising they'd never, ever be back again. And then they both turned around and booked it. As I looked after them, I still didn't know why they'd been so scared. I mean, sure, I'm a big dude, but more fat than muscle. Don't tell me it's because of my freaking broom or something. On the way back inside, I couldn't help but laugh about the entire situation. <sighs> Freaking teenagers. I barely entered my living room when I heard their voices again. I jerked around and went back to the balcony. Don't tell me... No one was outside. The balcony was empty. And so was the area in front of the building. What had I just heard? And then I saw my phone. TikTok was still open. And the stupid live stream from before was still playing. Holy shit, bro. What the fuck was that? Did you guys see that? Did you fucking see that? As I picked up my phone, I saw that the two of them were still running. 
The chat was going crazy. Messages were coming in at almost astronomical speed. I could barely read anything, but what I did mention the words crazy person and squatter. As I continued to listen, there was soon no doubt anymore. It was the two guys, the, the same two idiot teenagers who just tried to break into my place. I mean, hadn't they gone to some abandoned area, though? How did they end up here? I reasoned that they had given up on their urban exploring and went the fuck with people, but how they made it here so quickly? Where exactly did they go? There weren't any abandoned places nearby. By now, more and more people in chat were asking about the abandoned area, about its location. And when one of the hosts finally answered, it was even more confusing. It was my area. It was my home. But this place wasn't abandoned. I lived here. People lived here. I was right here, sitting in my living room. There was my bedroom, and over there... Okay, no, calm down. Don't, don't be an idiot. This was TikTok, after all. I mean, who knows? Maybe the entire live stream was pre-recorded, and in reality, they went out to fuck with people for new content. Hell, maybe, maybe they found me on their follower list, right? They saw that I lived nearby, they decided to prank me or something. Yeah, like, that had to be it. The more I tried to convince myself, however, the more I realized how ridiculous those scenarios were. Yet the alternative. A new notification interrupted my thoughts. It was a new TikTok video, one just posted by the guys whose live stream I was watching. When I read the title, I shivered. Highlight of the craziest live stream ever, running with insane squatter. We almost died. Holy shit, guys. I read it again, and then once more. With slightly shaking hands, I pressed play. I watched as the two of them walked past abandoned buildings, then... Then they were at the apartment complex, moving their flashlights around. Finally, one of them tried to climb onto a balcony, and right at that moment, an unkempt, bearded guy jumped from an opening that might once have been a balcony door. What the fuck? I heard him scream. The phone slipped from my hands and my head spun. There... There, there, was, there was no way. There was no freaking way. That was my voice, my face. Only, only it was... It, it was different. In the, in the video, I looked dirty, unkempt, bearded. My voice sounded rougher, deeper, almost crazier. I told myself I was wrong. This entire night was getting to me. My mind was playing tricks on me, that's all. Then I picked up the phone and I played the video again. There it was. My face. My voice. I watched as my alter ego burst from the building, holding a metal rod in his hands. I heard as I screamed at them in the most incoherent voice. The hell do you think you're doing? The same words. The ones that I had screamed at them not even an hour ago. In an instant, I threw the phone across the room. There was no way that that was real. Okay, it, it had to be fake. Some sort of stupid trick, a deep fake, or, or God knows what, all right? In an instant, I dashed into my bathroom, turned on the lights, and stared at myself in the mirror. There I was. Cleanly shaven, slightly muffled hair, but overall, pr pretty presentable. And then, for a second, I could almost see my hair grow, could almost see the dirty, unkempt beard and the crazy eyes I'd seen in the video. I cringed back. That's, that's not fucking real. Back in the living room, I shivered again. Why was it so cold? I could almost feel a breeze blowing through my apartment. I checked the balcony door again, but it was closed. As I stared outside, however, I wondered... How long had I lived here? When had I last spoken to someone? I mean, hell, when, when had I last seen anyone else who lived here?
I'm sitting here now, typing this out in as much detail as I can. I don't know what the hell's going on. With all this, I mean... I'm right here, in my apartment, sitting on my living room couch. Yet as I'm typing this, I can... I can feel it again. This cold, almost freezing breeze. And every once in a while, I can... I almost can't help going to a beard I know shouldn't be there. I was aware about the uproar over the use and abuse of artificial intelligence programs, but I hadn't given it much thought until very recently. See, in particular, a lot of people are alarmed about deepfake technology, and it's, I mean, it's had a lot of practical applications in the film and the gaming industry, but it can also be used to create misleading images, films, snippets of audio. The potentially harmful media can create anything from videos to inflammatory political content. And these cleverly made fakes can spread on social media like wildfire, damaging the reputations of their targets and influencing public opinion. I have a very strong reason to believe that there are even more sinister applications in store for us. The concept of reality is um, in danger, and no one will be safe. Until very recently, I didn't know much about the darker side of deepfake software. I mean, I was peripherally aware that it existed, I knew it getting used for nefarious purposes, but I mean, I'm not a confused old Luddite either, but a lot of that stuff kind of flies over my head, you know, I, I certainly never would have imagined this technology would someday affect me, an anonymous nobody on an ocean full of regular people, but you know, here we are. It was actually a more tech-savvy friend of mine who found this video, I mean, she discovered it while poking around on a sketchy video dump website, and she emailed a copy of it with a brief message that said, you should definitely see this. The video was just over a minute long, it appeared to depict some scene of violent civil unrest in an urban setting. It seemed to have been recorded at a downward angle, you know, as, as if the person filming was standing on a second floor balcony. The street was filled with a surging mob of rioters, and several buildings were on fire. The mob clashed with a razor straight line of police and riot gear who used their shields and clubs to drive them back. And the camera zoomed in on one lone individual who rushed at the line with a long knife in his hand. He attempted to stab one of the cops. He was knocked to the ground by a hard push with a riot shield. The cops promptly surrounded the fallen attacker, and they, they beat him into a bloody mess. And in the background, someone lit up a Molotov cocktail, threw it into the midst. The resulting spray of burning fuel ignited both the cops, the attackers, everyone who was receiving the beating... The camera followed one of the burning cops as he ran into the crowd, who promptly swarmed him down and beat him with their protest signs. Now at this point, the screen abruptly went to darkness, and the word Test 13 Riot appeared for a split second, you know, bold font, and then the video just ended. I watched the clip several times in a row, trying to understand and absorb whatever the hell I was looking at. I messaged my friend back, I asked, what's this? Where and when did this happen? She replied, was labeled a deep fake, no context in the description. The title was the same as the text at the end of the video. Watch it again, look carefully at the person who sets the cop on fire. I'm almost positive. That's you. I said, what the hell? I hit play again, and yep, I mean, she's right. That I was too distracted by the general mayhem to notice on my first few viewings, but the person throwing that Molotov, he looked looked exactly like me. They had my build, my face. I mean, you could even see my tattoo on the forearm. But here's the problem, see. I've never participated in a riot. I most certainly never burned anyone with a bottle of homemade napalm. I felt a deep unease stir in my gut as I rewatched those five seconds. The same footage over and over again, trying to make sense of why, how this could have happened. I messaged her, I said, that's... This is really weird. Why would someone do this? Neither of us could think of an adequate explanation. I filled out the contact form on the website, explained the situation. 
In the days that followed, I waited for a response. I kept watching the clip at half speed, picking it apart second by second. And upon closer scrutiny, I found a number of glitches and, and imperfections. I mean, for example, most of the protest signs were either completely blank or they were covered with indecipherable squiggles. I, mean, I also noticed many of the background writers looked eerily similar to each other. There were maybe five or six variations of faces amongst the hundreds of people on the street. Some of them had impossibly long arms. There was even the occasional floating head with no discernible body beneath it. Even the raging fires were a bit odd-looking, I mean, if, you, if you paid close enough attention. The video seemed to be a work in progress, as suggested by the text at the end of the video. But even so, it was, it was still pretty convincing at a casual glance. The sheer pandemonium in the background helped cover up the mistakes. If I had seen this video while zoning out, you know, some late night scrolling or something, I probably wouldn't have questioned if it was real. I could only find three faces in total that were noticeably unique or different from the rest. They all belonged to rioters who were engaged in particularly violent or destructive activities. There was a Molotov thrower, a cop stabber, a pistol girl, or young woman who appeared to be firing a pistol at police. These characters were all made to stand out with subtle manipulation of placement, shading, shadow. If the fake footage ever found its way onto a newscast, they would undoubtedly focus on this nefarious trio in the editing room. The video's creator had randomly stolen real faces for these key players, and one of them was mine. I wondered if I was maybe slipping into paranoid conspiracy nut theory, so I passed my observation along to my friend, asked for her input. She agreed with everything I said, and then she made an interesting point of her own. The video felt very much like a blank template. I mean, the settings were a generic city street, lined with generic buildings. It could have taken place in almost any city in North America. The empty protest signs could be filled with any slogans which seemed appropriate for any given narrative. The finished product would be a very convincing and very frightening look at civil unrest in action. She also pointed out that compared to the feral aggression of the mob, it seemed like the orderly and disciplined riot cops were meant to be the protagonists of the story. The video spun a powerful narrative of law and order versus agitator mayhem, and there I was, front and center, in all of this madness. And the more I thought about it, the more I was convinced that my likeness had been stolen for, I don't know, a, a future propaganda piece. I asked her why someone would upload this thing before it was ready. My friend answered with a shrug emoji. She just said, found it mixed with a bunch of other deepfake videos. Might have been uploaded by accident. Even smart people make mistakes. At that point, several days had passed without a response from whoever was running the website. I decided to contact them again and discovered that the URL was broken. I tried to find them on Google, but it seemed the entire site, all of its content, they'd just been scrubbed from the internet. I tried to convince myself of the timing, you know, that it was just a coincidence, but I wasn't so sure about that. The next morning, I crawled out of bed and I discovered that I'd been robbed. The, the burglar had picked the lock and crept into my apartment in the dead of the night. Only two things were missing. My laptop and my phone. Having a stranger quietly ransack my apartment while I was sleeping was bad enough, but my phone had been sitting on the nightstand beside my bed, and that was much worse. The intruder was actually inside my bedroom while I was snoozing comfortably in bed. They had been standing right beside me in the dark. I had no idea what was happening. I reported the break-in to the police, but the cop who came to make the report was suspicious of my claims. He repeatedly asked if anything else had been stolen, he pointed out that my wallet had been sitting on the side table, on that same desk as the missing laptop, completely untouched. I acknowledged that it seemed far-fetched, but I stuck to my guns. After he left, I drove over to my friend's house and made another disturbing discovery. She had also been robbed of all of her electronics. Nothing else had been stolen. She'd slept right through the entire incident without hearing a single peep. I asked if she'd contacted the police yet. She gave me a funny look. Slowly, she said, I don't think that's a good idea. They wouldn't be able to help anyway. I think we should just drop it and leave it alone. Get a new phone. 
Forget about it. As she was talking, she grabbed a pen and an envelope from a stack of mail on her counter. She tapped the back of the envelope to get my attention. She wrote, They could be listening. I read those four words and felt my entire body clench with anxiety. I suddenly felt very exposed and horribly vulnerable. I, I nodded silently and watched as she pushed the envelope into the paper shredder. I mean, I was conscious of how easy it would be for a powerful entity to make me disappear. You know, if they could break into my apartment and take a phone from my bedside table, what would stop them from taking me? I mean, they'd already stolen my face. Why not take the rest while they were at it? After this bizarre string of events, I, I no longer felt safe at home. I deleted all of my social medias. I mean, but the damage was done. I had already given out my likeness, my data, literally hundreds of occasions. Like, Likewise, I, I decided that moving to a new apartment wouldn't solve anything. They could find me, watch me wherever I tried to go. I mean, let's be honest here. No one is safe from the powers that be, not anywhere. You might feel like you're anonymous within the masses, but the school of fish defense doesn't work anymore. It's just a, a, a flimsy illusion in the age of technology. You're photographed, you're videotaped numerous times every day, every time you venture out of your home, dozens of cameras, observing your every movement throughout the day. I mean, even inside your own home, it's possible for another party to watch you through the camera in your laptop. I mean, but never mind the cameras. They're the least of your worries as far as surveillance is concerned. Your cell phone is the worst offender. I mean, if it's on, it's always listening. It relentlessly tracks your journey through life from the cozy security of your own pocket. Even if you ditched the cell phone, you fled to a remote area to live as a hermit, you still wouldn't be safe. I mean, if they wanted to find you, there are a number of spy satellites, drones, things like that that could do the job with dizzying efficiency. It'd only be a matter of time. If Test 13 Riot was ever broadcasted to the public, I'd be split into two different people. One would be innocent. The other would be a murderer. And the only people who would question it would be those who knew me personally. Everyone else would think I was a wild-eyed maniac. And I mean, why wouldn't they? Hell, they saw me commit a crime on video. I mean, didn't they? If the quality was convincing enough, even those who knew me would probably find themselves doubting my innocence. How can they deny something they could clearly see? I don't sleep very well these days. I see in the news, I'm always on edge. I had to trust everyone I see in the news. The powers that be have a one-two combo that can't be countered. I mean, some people will readily accept their propaganda as truth. Others will fracture into nihilistic pockets of denialists who view all information as lies. When people can no longer believe what they see, they won't believe in anything at all. One group is easily controlled, the other is hopelessly fractured, and either way, those who seek to manufacture the future will soon wield all the power. We're entering the post-reality era of technological society. If you can still trust your own eyes, then you'll see. The future's bleak. I awoke in the desert, a figure looming above me. You picked one hell of a place to take a siesta, mister, the tall man said, straightening up and looking towards the horizon, one large hand stroking his handlebar mustache thoroughly. He was dressed head to foot in black, a large pistol hanging low on his hip. What's it to you? I said, a little sourly, not happy at being once again in another desert. At least this one was... Blessedly free of radiation. Still, the sun burned my skin where it sat, white-hot fire in the hazy blue sky. The man turned back to me, pulling his long duster coat to one side, revealing a glittering golden star. The name's Ert, he said, looking me up and down. Why, Ert? I'm law around these parts. You want to watch your lip around me, boy. I ain't known for my patience. Now, why don't you tell old Wyatt why you're doing out here reeking of booze on the outskirts of town? 
What town? I blurted. Holy mother of Christ, he spat. You answer every question in one of your own. Tombstone, boy. Stop your delay and answer the question. You going into town drunk? His hands were now hovering over his pistols. My mind was racing, tripping over itself. Tombstone, Wyatt Earp. Jesus, I could hardly believe it. He was just about to make a grab for me when I blurted out the first lie that came to mind. Drunk. I I got drunk as hell. Must have staggered out of town to take a piss, just keeled over, I said. Trying hard to play the simpleton. From town, he said, his hazy blue eyes narrowing. And just when did you hit town? See, I know just about every resident of the tombstone. You ain't one of them. For once, I couldn't think of a single answer, but a gunshot suddenly rang out, and a woman screamed in pain. God damn it, he said, whirling towards the town. Those goddamn sons of bitch cowboys are in town again. And just like that, he hurried away. Stalking back towards Tombstone as if I no longer existed. Sagging with relief, I mopped at my brow, glad to be out of his presence. Impressive, isn't he? A voice growled from behind me. I whirled around, coming eye to eye with a huge mountain lion that had seemingly materialized out of nowhere and now sat on a nearby rock, its head cocked to one side as if wondering how good I would taste. He made it into heaven by the skin of his ass, Lucifer continued. What a prize he would have been, such a challenge to break. <laughs> oh well, he sighed. You can't always get what you want. But sometimes what you need. I muttered. Ah, a Stones fan, are you, Mr. Davis? Personally, my favorite is Sympathy for the Devil. He chuckled obscenely. I wasn't really listening to him anymore, but I had fallen to my knees, frantically digging in the surrounding sand. What are you doing? He said, a hint of amusement in his voice. I'm looking for the knife, I shot back at him. What do you think I'm doing? Digging for grubs? He said, somewhat loftily. Either way, the thing that you are so desperately seeking isn't there. I stopped digging. Then where the hell is it? I want to get this over and done with. He looked back at me, and then his feral green eyes narrowed before lunging forward with blinding speed. I felt a terrible pain. I sat down hard, my chest bleeding. I cried out as I looked down at my flayed open chest, the gleam of bone shining wetly in the midday sun. But already the skin was beginning to knit and heal. Lucifer sat there silently watching me heal until finally I managed to crawl to my feet. The instant I stood, he gave me more of the same, only this time, shattering my ribcage, sending me flying into the sand in an explosion of blood and bone. I lay there for some time, feeling my body slowly begin to heal and reform. Finally, when I was whole again, I crawled to my knees and I sat there before him, my head bowed low. At last, he began to speak. I understand your need to wrap up this little adventure of ours, but always remember one thing, Mr. Davis. I am the master, and you are my dog. Don't you ever bark at me again. Now, get to your feet. I did as I was bid, keeping my eyes on my feet. Look at me, Christian. Look at me and tell me who you serve. You, my lord, I said and a kind of sadness came over me, as if I had somehow disappointed him and was in need of making amends. But I wasn't sure if this feeling came from me or was just another one of his sly tricks. And why is it you serve me so faithfully? There was something in his voice now, a kind of longing. Taking a deep breath, I did the only thing I could. I told the truth. Because I fear you, I stammered. I fear you more than anything I've ever known, more than the wrath of God Almighty himself. He grinned then. Well, for now, that is enough. You asked a question. Would you like an answer? Yes, Lord. Then ask again, and this time, mind your manners when you speak to me. The knife my lord. I said, bowing low. Where's the hellbound blade? Follow, he growled. 
leaping from the rock and heading deeper into the desert. We walked for hours, the sun giving way to shadows as we entered the shade of a small rocky outcrop. In there, he said, nodding towards a small cave-like entrance, surrounded by sagging timbers. What's in there? I got up the nerve to ask, but he ignored me, loping inside. The place was pitch black and I stumbled, my shoulders brushing the rough hewn wall. Open your eyes, Mr. Davis. Really, open them. Remember the power I bequeathed you at Draven's Castle. Open your eyes and see. And just like that, the veil fell from my eyes and I could see clear as day in the deep darkness of this forgotten mind. Very good, Mr. Davis, very good indeed. You have such power. Now, more than ever, you must stop and learn to use it. With that hanging in the air between us, he hurried on ahead. A few minutes later, I came upon him, sat staring at a pile of massive boulders, broken timbers and dusty rubble, blocking the depths of the shattered mine. What now? I asked, standing beside him. He turned to me, his tongue lolling. The knife is behind that mess of boulders. If you still feel you need it, that is, then you must retrieve it for yourself. What? I exclaimed. And how the hell do you expect me to do that? And why is it buried there anyway? I said, pointing an accusing finger at the fallen boulders. Because I put it there. He grinned. Playtime's over, Mr. Davis. If you still feel you need that knife, then you must get it for yourself. What are you talking about? Of course I need it. I mean, how else can I reap this final soul? How indeed, he said, staring at me blankly. I knew there would be no answers forthcoming, and so began to mooch around the edges of the fallen boulders, looking for a way inside. At my touch, a light burst into being, shining through a narrow hole from the other side. Wincing, I put my eye to the hole. The blade had burst into light in my presence and lay amongst the debris and rubble just on the other side. At the sight of it, I felt a terrible longing and pounded at the hard rock in frustration. I see you found a way through, Lucifer chuckled. Some entrance, I turned on him. He shrugged. Do you remember Albert Foster? How could I forget? I grimaced. He had been the second soul I had captured, a corpse peddler. It had haunted the fog-strewn streets of Victorian London. What about him? I continued. Lucifer sighed. Do you remember how he escaped when you confronted him that second time? I mean, after he set me on fire with flaming fists, I shuddered, still remembering the god-awful pain. Just so, Lucifer chuckled. You were quite the mess that particular day when awful Albert had got through with you, but we aren't talking about that. We're talking about how he escaped you the second time. The cockroaches, I said, remembering Albert's terrible transformation. Just so, Lucifer said, slinking closer until I could feel his hot breath against my face. The cockroaches! But I can't do that, I stammered, looking at him incredulously. That was power given to him by Asmodeus, the one who orchestrated the breakout in the first place. Ah, uh, yeah, Asmodeus. We can talk of him another time, but tell me, Mr. Davis, do you believe Asmodeus' power is greater than mine? Or even your own? My own. Yes, your own, he snapped, his tail swishing angrily. Are you not my chosen? Haven't I promised you all the powers of hell? Must I now explain everything to that dull mind of yours when we are close to the end, or is it only fear and pain you understand and respect? If so, let me encourage you. If you don't transform and get through the wall, then I'm going to rip your balls off, he snarled and showed razor-sharp teeth. I'm going to tear you open again and again until you either do as I bid, or you go insane with the pain of it all. But I, I don't know how, I cried out, backing away from him. He sighed then, some of the anger melting from him as he sat on his haunches. It's rather simple, Mr. Davis. Just bring your will to bear. Wish it to be so, and it will be. 
want it like you wanted the deaths of so many of your victims, to have the primal desire of yours, that desire that you have so long tried to convince yourself is no longer there, that fury and bloodlust, the hatred, let it loose, become the creature you were always meant to be. I turned from him and glared down at the hole. He was right. He was always right. There was no longer any need to hide, no desire to change. I was already a lost soul, my days condemned to eternal torment. The worst that could happen had happened. I had been forsaken by both man and God, and there was literally nothing else to lose. Feeling that old hatred well up in me, building until I thought that I would burst with it, I directed my will, and I felt myself begin to change until I wasn't one but many, a scurrying mass with a thousand eyes that crawled up the wall and through the small opening, reforming back into human form on the other side. Howling in triumph, I scooped up the glowing blade. Lucifer answered my howl with one of his own, an ear-piercing shriek that brought me back to my senses. I had the blade, but I was... I was now trapped. If I took on my insect form again, I would no longer be able to carry the knife. Suddenly, I was furious that mere stone would dare to stand against me. Bringing my will to bear, I slammed my fist into the rock, causing the whole mass to explode outward in a shower of dust and rubble. Lucifer just managed to leap out of the way, and there came a low rumbling from deep in the ground. Run, Mr. Davis. If you don't want to spend an eternity buried alive, run! I did as he said, both of us sprinting for the exit. We managed to jump free just as the whole mess came shattering down in an explosion of choking dust and flying pebbles. Subtle, Christian, he glared at me, shaking dust from his coat. Very subtle indeed. Sorry, I said, somewhat sheepishly, feeling suddenly exhausted where I sat, covered in dust and filth. Lucifer patted over and licked my face with a long, wet tongue. Don't worry. It takes some getting used to. You'll find it exhausting at first, but your batteries will recharge. In fact, now that the process has started, you'll only get stronger. But why? Why, why have you given me these gifts now when we're so close to the end? Who says it's the end? This is only the beginning. There's so much you don't know, so much I need to tell you, but there's no time now. So we must finish what we started. The final soul, you mean? Yes. The man you're looking for is just east of here in a cliffside encampment. He and his bunch of bandits have taken over a small town. It's from there that they strike terror and discord throughout the land. The man you seek is Harvey Dillon. A murderer, rustler of cattle. In life, he was heavily into torture. The things he did to the flesh of victims could rival the horrors of hell. And now he's back and so much worse than before. Not that I give a fig for his victims, but he belongs to me. He belongs in hell. And that's what you're going to do, Mr. Davis. You're going to bring him back to us, aren't you? I stood up and brushed away the last of my humanity. You're goddamn right I am. We walked through the night, Lucifer padding along beside me. He seemed stronger now, like he could stay in this world longer than before, even if it was only trapped in the body of a lower base creature. The first rays of dawn were just starting to stain the night sky when he heard the sound of a rider coming on hard behind us. Suddenly, Lucifer grabbed up my sleeve and dragged me down into the underbrush. The hell are you doing? Be silent, he hissed. Don't move. Don't make a fucking sound. Moments later, a horse galloped into view, frothing at the mouth as the rider pulled hard at the reins, bringing the big mare to a halt. A pair of dusty boots hit the ground. From our position, I could just make out the man's lower half. He wore a long, dust-smeared overcoat. A shiny revolver hung low on his hip. And in one scarred and battered hand, he held a torn-looking Bible that seemed to be missing many pages. 
The man's feet turned as if he were scanning his surroundings. And my body broke into a cold sweat, fear warming its way into my guts. Therefore, the man intoned, as the tongue of fire burns the dried grass, you shall go down in flames for your roots. They are rotten, and your blossoms shall be nothing more than dust on the wind. For you have forsaken the Lord thy God and rejected his laws. Henceforth I shall stretch out his hand against you. I'll find you, he muttered. I'll find you and I'll send you back to hell from whence you came. That said, he mounted his horse and rode away. I let out a breath I didn't even realize I'd been holding, and I sagged down the tension, leaving my body. Who is that? I said, turning to Lucifer. Trouble, he replied, glaring at the receding figure. A preacher driven mad by the light of God. A joker in the pack, the eye in the middle of a storm. God's feeble attempt to divert the course of prophecy. Many times I've tried to rid myself of the thorn in my side. Once, when his wife's cold, dead fingers closed around his throat, I thought I had him. But his love for God was greater, and it prevailed. Let me kill him for you, my lord. No, he snapped at me. You must leave him alone. Go nowhere near him, not unless he forces a confrontation. I must leave you now, he suddenly blurted. This body can no longer hold my magnificence, just... Just over the horizon is the town. Go there. They know of the man you seek. For now, farewell. And just like that, he was gone, leaving the corpse of a mountain lion behind, which immediately began to rot and smoke. I walked on, the sun beating down on me like an anvil, until at last I crested the cactus-strewn hill and looked down at the town below. It looked more like every town ever seen in the Spaghetti Western. All bleached timbers, false storefronts, horseshit-strewn streets. Slowly I made my way down to the outskirts of town, not really sure where I was going or who I was supposed to be talking to. But this was far from the first time Lucifer had left me with my dick swinging in the wind. I just have to make the best of things. Besides, with my newfound powers, I was feeling more confident than ever before. As I walked more fully into town, people seemed to be giving me sideways glances and quickly scurrying away. What the hell, I murmured, just before I felt a sudden blow to the back of my head. It all went dark. I awoke in a darkened cell. There was blood on my hair, but of course no wound. Quickly I felt around and found the hellbound blade still stuffed down the back of my jeans. There came a sudden rattling of keys and a squeaking of a door. The corridor was lit by a flickering oil lamp. A man stood outside my cell. He was willow-thin, with a shock of red hair, and wiry-looking side chops. A silver star glittering on his narrow chest. You got some nerve showing your face back in this town, Andy Wayne, after what you did to that whore over in Ed's place. Then burned down the church and all. There's a whole mess of people right now over at Ed's drinking it up. I'm planning a hanging party. You know what, Andy? I was pretty fond of Jessie before you messed up her face. Guess you can call me a regular. He grinned, a gap-toothed smile. So I reckon I'm just going to let them hang you, partner. Now, how do you feel about that? Well, I said, stumbling along the bars and feigning exhaustion. I think you're a pock-faced son of a whore and the best part of you ran down the crack of your mama's ass, I said. I spat in his face and began to laugh hysterically. His face went first red, then purple as he fumbled his keys in the lock, revolver in hand. Boy, I'll beat you black and blue when we was kids, and I want to beat you down again. There won't be much left of you for that hanging party. You better believe that. Thrusting open the door, he charged in, smashing the gun barrel across my face. I grinned at him through smashed teeth and a torn mouth, grabbing his hand and smashing it against my knee, sending his revolver flying. His wrist snapped like a rotten twig. He bellowed in pain, but I caught him up by the throat. I pulled the knife from around my back. I plunged it into his shoulder before twisting it cruelly, dragging it out and thrusting it into his thigh. Screaming, he sagged and fell to the floor, grasping at his bleeding leg and rocking to and fro. I kicked him over and over again, 
for kneeling down beside him, my knife at his neck. I'm looking for the Dylan gang, I growled, pressing the blade hard against his bobbing Adam's apple. You wouldn't know where said banditos would happen to be, would you? The light of hope gleamed in his eyes. Sure, sure, he gasped. They're camped up at High Canyon Ridge. They took over Heston's ranch. Hell, they took over the entire village. Where is it? This High Canyon Ridge. Two days east of here. Just follow the river out of town. Can't miss it. Please, Andy, don't kill me, okay? Sorry. Andy ain't home. I grinned, dragging the knife across his throat. His hot blood spurted over me. Quickly, I stood up and headed outside. There I was greeted by the townsfolk, flaming torches held aloft. It seemed like there was a gun or a rope dangling from every hand. I looked down at my bloody clothes and grinned at him. Just give me a second to explain. There was a cry of outrage and bullets began to fly, sending me crashing backwards as I was peppered with hot lead, my shirt and chest exploding in a welter of blood. The last shot rang out, and there was silence. Until I stood back up. That's when the women began to scream and the men began to curse. Quickly reloading, some of them took to their heels. You want to play? I grinned down at them through bloody teeth. Okay. I can do that. Let's play. Bringing my will to bear, I summoned the hellfire to my hand and released it amongst them. The flames jumped from one person to the next, lighting them up, their skin melting, running like hot wax as they thrashed and screamed. And when it was all over, I walked amongst them, their ashes stirring on the ground in the cold night wind as I followed the river out of town. The morning found me by the riverside, washing ashes and blood from my clothes. There was a splash, and a nearby beaver pulled itself out of its free-flowing waters. Lucifer? Is that you? Who else? The beaver chuckled. Just before its head blew apart into about 300 pieces, spattering my face with blood and gore. I spun around. There was a cowboy rushing down the hill towards me, his one good blue eye blazing with pure hate. I got you now, you son of a bitch! He fired off another round, but stumbled just as he pulled the trigger. The shot went wild, but the bullet, which I was pretty sure was meant for my head, buried in my shoulder. The pain was enormous, like, like nothing I'd ever felt before. It spun me around, dumping me into the freezing river, the current pulling me away. The cowboy stood on the riverbanks, barking off round after round. Another bullet clipped my ear, and I ducked under the flowing water. Whoever he was, the son of a bitch was deadly accurate. You can't hide from me, boy, the mad preacher screamed as I rounded the bend. You can't run from Jacob Masterson. God's gonna cut you down. You hear me, you son of a bitch? God's gonna cut you down. I stayed in the river for some time, letting the hard current drag me miles between us before I finally managed to climb out into the opposite side of the riverbank. There I collapsed, and I checked my wounds. They hadn't closed, but burned like acid small wisps of smoke rising from the wound in my shoulder. A crow landed on my outstretched boot and hopped up my leg as it drew close to my face. I could hear it muttering to itself. Bible-thumping, Jesus-loving son of a bitch, it cursed. Of all the goddamn nerve. Lucifer, I gasped. Is that you? Ask me that just one more fucking time, he caught in my face, and I swear by the bloodiest depths of hell I will peck out your eyes. Kate, Kate. I threw up my hands in surrender, wincing at the pain in my shoulder. Why isn't it healing? I said, flopping back down. Because that crazy asshole shot you with silver. Blessed silver, actually. We need to get this out of you before the poison spreads to your body and it starts to shut down. Okay, now hold still. Suddenly, his head darted down, and he buried his sharp beak into the raw wound. I screamed in agony as he rooted around. After what felt like an eternity of pain, he pulled free the smoking silver slug and spat it onto the ground. Immediately, the wound began to close, and the pain began to first fade, then eventually vanished altogether. I was instantly on my feet, suddenly ferocious. 
I'm going to kill that mad motherfucker, I growled. I'm going to cut him into little pieces and piss on his bones. No, you're not. I told you to stay away from him. Like I have a choice. I cut him off. He's tracking me somehow. He He's fucking tracking me. Perhaps, he replied. But Masterson is not the target you're here for. Dylan, he must die now. Today. Time grows short. But it has to be today. Why? I asked. Why today? Stop your infernal questions, he snapped at me. Just get on with your job. I will run interference on Masterson. Once the job is done, he will become irrelevant to the whole thing. What thing? I asked him, knowing he was keeping something from me. But I didn't quite have the nerve. There's a bridge about a mile down the river, he said, lighting up upon a nearby branch. Cross the bridge. Follow the winding path out of the canyon. The place you seek sits upon a nearby ridge. That said, he took to the sky. Soon he was nothing more than a black dot on the horizon. <sighs> Sighing, I clambered to my feet, brushing myself down and quickly hurried away, keeping my ears open for the sound of the pounding hooves. Whoever that Masterson character was, he had Lucifer unnerved, and I wanted no more part of him. Best to just finish up here and get back to the safety of hell. Less than an hour later, I came upon the ridge, which was nothing more than a few splintered planks held together with frayed ropes, the river flowing fast beneath. Taking a deep breath, I sprinted across, wincing at every creak and crack until finally, I was across. The rocky sides of the canyon rose up before me. There was an arrow path leading straight through the canyon's sheer sides, and another small track that wound its way up the flat-looking ridge. I could just make out the sides of a small building and the muted sounds of human voices. Okay, I mumbled. Up we go. The track itself was narrow, perhaps wide enough to accommodate a single horse, not much more. I was about halfway up when I noticed the vultures circling overhead and the faint smell of smoke that blew on the light breeze. Shit, I cursed, drawing the knife and coming on the run. By the time I hit the top, I was breathing heavily and drenched with sweat. Just like Lucifer had said, there was a village here atop this flat plateau, or at least, at least there had been. Now there was nothing more than a smoldering ruin, bodies of men, women, children, and even a few horses lay scattered about, their poor broken bodies smoking in the midday sun. Welcome to hell, partner, a voice rang out. A wild-eyed man stepped from one of the charred and blackened ruins. He was shirtless, his jeans torn and bloody. In one shaking hand, he held a revolver leveled at my chest. In the other, a half-empty bottle of whiskey. The hell happened here? I asked, lowering the knife. He laughed then, the light of madness dancing on his bloodshot eyes. Harvey's what happened here, he spat. Kill everyone, the whole village, his crew. I've seen things, he said, tears rolling down his face. Things no man should ever see. Harvey, he had powers. He burned everyone. And that laughter, he mumbled. That god-awful laughter. He shook his head, as if trying to rid himself of the memory of it before raising the bottle and gulping down the fiery liquid. At last, the bottle was empty and he cast it away from him. I hear it, mister. Even when I sleep, even drunk. He chuckled obscenely. I can hear it right now. Suddenly, he put the revolver to his head. No! I screamed, lunging at him. But he had already pulled the trigger, the sound of the shot booming around the canyon's walls. Son of a bitch! I screamed, kicking his flopping corpse more out of frustration than any real anger. Whatever had happened here, I had missed it. And Harvey Dillon had moved on, leaving his crew behind, or what was left of them anyway. Putting the knife away, I stomped across to the only remaining intact building, the one I had observed from the bottom of the trail. I went through the open door, but recoiled in horror as a swarm of flies fled before me. 
There were bodies here, three of them, hanging from the ceiling. It was impossible to make out the sex, they were too torn up for that. They had been skinned and butchered, bone and flesh gleaming wetly, and even I cursed, hoping like hell they'd been dead before this terrible torture had taken place. Quickly I left, slamming the door behind me. What now? I mumbled to myself. Where the hell did you go? How the hell am I supposed to find you? Lucifer's words came back to me. It has to be now. Today. Worried, I looked at the midday sun. God only knew what he would do to me if I failed him. Sitting down in the blowing sand, I once again remembered Lucifer's words. Will it, and it will be. Concentrating, I cast my will into the wind, feeling my awareness searching for Dylan's rotting soul. And there it was. Just west of here, a dark figure in the desert sat by a blazing campfire, gleaming eye hooded beneath a wide-brimmed hat. I have you now, asshole, I growled, leaping to my feet. Even now I could feel him like a magnet pulling me like a iron filling toward him. Strolling over to one of the dead horses, I laid a hand upon its smoking flesh. Rise, I commanded. Rise and serve me. At first, nothing happened. Gritting my teeth and bringing all of my hate and rage to bear, I thrust it forward into the dead creature that began to shudder and twist. At last, its deflated eyes began to fill until they rolled white and the dead thing stumbled to its feet. Not wasting any time, I grabbed at its tattered mane and jumped on its back. Digging my feet into the black and skeletal sides, immediately the creature began to gallop. Guided by my will, we raced down the canyon side, the stench of burned flesh and blood covering me like a comforting haze. Night was coming on fast when I spotted his flickering campfire in the near distance. Climbing from my mount, I clicked my fingers, turning it to dust in the wind. I sat down, crossed my legs, and called out to Lucifer, wanting to know more about my quarry before the final confrontation. Suddenly there was a sharp bite on the back of my hand. Cursing, I looked down and saw a huge, hairy tarantula. Poisonous as ever, I see. But the spider did not answer, but merely started to crawl away. Still, the message was clear. Get on with the job. Sighing, I got to my feet and squashed the little bastard, just out of pure spite, before continuing onwards. Not even bothering with stealth, now comfortable with my newfound powers, I approached the dying campfire and the man hunkered down by its flickering light. So you finally came for me, the man chuckled. The devil's- Yeah, I interrupted. The devil's bitch. Lapdog is Satan. I've heard it all before, my friend. You're such a fool. He laughed, casually climbing to his feet. Didn't you ever wonder what's really going on here? I know exactly what's going on, I smirked at him. I know all about it, rebellion of hell, Asmodeus, setting you free to undermine my master. He laughed then, and slapped his knee. <laughs> rebellion in hell. Like they would ever dare to go against your master, he said mockingly. Well, you're here, aren't you? I said, not falling for his ruse. You escaped. Now I'm here to send you back. Escaped, he said, shaking his head sadly. Not escaped. Set free. Nothing happens in hell without Lucifer say so. But, but why? I stammered. Why would he set you free? You and the other four? That's the question. He grinned at me, but there was a great sadness in his eyes. For pawns, my friend. Pawns on the great chessboard of eternity, so let's play. And I believe he grinned slyly. It's my move. Suddenly he raised his hands and a great maelstrom began to blow, whipping up in the sand. Quickly I threw up my hand to protect my face. Even through the biting sand I could see him twist and turn as he went through some terrible transformation. Other figures rising up from the endless sands, and just like that, the wind dropped and a herd of crimson-eyed horses suddenly stood before me. With a great snorting and thundering of hooves, they raced towards me, meaning to trample me to dust. A shot rang out, 
and the lead horse went down, exploding into hardened sand. Another shot rang out, another one, and another of the demons went down. Something hit me high in the chest, throwing me to one side. Blood and bone exploded. I landed hard on my back, unable to breathe. It was that mad preacher, the one Lucifer had called Jacob riding like the wind towards the demon herd. The reins of his big mare clamped between his teeth, a pistol in each hand, laying the very wrath of God upon the now terrified horses who had turned to flee. Clamoring to my feet, feeling the terrible silver spread through my body, I saw him fire a last shot, hitting the transformed Harvey in the side of the neck. Instantly, the rest of the herd turned to dust and Harvey. Harvey lay in the dirt, bleeding hard, gravely injured, but still very much alive. Masterson took no notice of him, but whirled his big mount around, coming straight for me. Come on then, you son of a bitch, I growled, raising the now burning blade. Grinning, Masterson fired off another shot, and the blade in my hand exploded. It was as if I heard every soul in hell cry out at its destruction. Sighting down the barrel of his gun, Masterson pulled the trigger. Intent on my destruction, but his eyes widened in shock as his gun clicked empty. With a cry of triumph, I swung what was left of the shattered blade at him, burying it in the back of the mare's chest. The horse screamed and went down with an explosion of blood and sand, trapping its rider beneath. Quickly I staggered over, blood pouring from the terrible wound in my chest, but the preacher had already managed to kick himself free. Even as badly injured as he was, his fingers were already doing their deadly dance as he quickly reloaded his smoking revolvers. With a cry, I charged at him, but he grinned, raising the revolvers, and I knew I was dead. But suddenly he howled in pain and began to dance around, firing his guns into the dirt that was now somehow crawling with large black snakes that hissed and struck at him. Still, he shot them, blowing them into tiny pieces, and when his guns clicked empty, he stomped them into the dirt, growling and spitting curses. But even his terrible vitality could not last, and he went down under the onslaught of the deadly venom. The snakes all around him began to squirm and meld into a giant serpent with glowing red eyes looming above him. Ah, Masterson, it hissed. I have you at last. What a thorn in my side you've been. Unbelievably, the old preacher laughed. The serpent suits you, Lucifer. A low creature that crawls with its face in the dirt. Shunned by all men. Lucifer hissed venom, dripping from his needle-like fangs, smoking where it hit the parched earth. Fearless as ever, Masters. But it's you who now lies in the dirt. You're a dying old man, but you could live yet. Join me. Bow before me. Call me Master and King of Kings, and I will spare your life. Again that harsh laugh. I'd rather fuck a cornhole filled with chili flakes than serve a poor broken down asshole such as yourself. You're nothing to me but a low down mangy dog. Oh, get to killing me. You're tired of your yammering. Lucifer howled his outrage and frustration. Christian, he commanded, slithering away. Kill this fool. I'll not soil myself with his death. Staggering over, my knees weakened. I collapsed on top of him, straddling his broken body. His hand came up, weakly grabbing for my throat, his eyes filled with hate, blood on his lips, but I knocked his clawing hand aside and pinned them beneath my knees. Who are you? I screamed into his face. Who the hell are you, Masterson? But he didn't answer me. Only looked up to the heavens as if listening intently and smiled. The sun's my son. That'll be the end of you, he growled at me. Now get to killing me if that's what you're going to do. I bought my ticket to heaven long ago. I ain't afraid of dying, son. Besides, I'm already tired of looking at your asshole face. That said, he spat a wad of bloody phlegm right into my face. With a howl of rage, I pulled what was left of the hellbound blade from the dead horse and raised it above my head for the killing strike. But the light had already faded from those hazel blue eyes. He lay there, dead. A small smile frozen on his lips, his eyes turned up towards heaven. Yeah, you had balls, my friend, I said, 
wiping his blood from my face. I give you that. And you had balls. A groan came just off to my right. It was Harvey Dillon pulling himself through the sand like a broken snake, leaving a trail of sticky blood behind him. Standing, I weaved over to him and knocked him onto his back before straddling his twisted form. I brought what was left of the hellbound blade down, piercing the diseased heart beneath, then sending his loathsome soul straight back to hell. But suddenly, time slowed, and then stopped, before the final blow could land. Please, don't, the voice said to my right. I slowly turned my head, the rest of my body frozen in time. There was an angel kneeling before me. Its great white wings spread across its back, their tips brushing against the sand. Please don't, Mr. Davis. All of creation depends upon the final move. Who are you? I asked, shocked by its beauty and splendor. I'm Gabriel, it said its beautiful blue eyes boring into mine. I am the messenger of God. Impressive, isn't he? Lucifer laughed, where he had appeared just off to my left, but this time he wasn't in the body of some loathsome beast animal, but in his own beautiful, terrible form, his black wings folded about him as if seeking comfort. I looked from one to the other. In many ways they were the same, but in others terrifyingly different. The angel looked to be full of light and love. Lucifer, on the other hand, was filled with a swirling darkness, and yet he was still more beautiful than the glowing angel, as if his darkness didn't diminish him, but somehow added to his allure. Brother, the angel said, acknowledging Lucifer, who gave the slightest of nods in return. Say what you have to say, Gabriel, your presence offends me. The angel ignored that and turned to face him once again. He's been lying to you, my son, for he was ever the great liar. He has been using you all this time. From the moment you were born, he's corrupted you, bent you to his will. What are you talking about? I gasped, unable to comprehend. He's put his mark on you the moment you were born, Gabriel continued gently. He marked you as one of his own. It was he who turned you into a mad killer. All those nights in that orphanage... Slithering from the shadows, laying under your crib, whispering an endless deluge of obscenities into your poor, innocent mind. Don't you understand? It was him who drove you mad, set you on the path to mayhem, murder. He cemented your free will. But why? I gasped. Why me? What does he want from me? The angel smiled sadly and gently stroked my brow. He wants you to free him, to break the very seals of hell and bring his kingdom to earth. It, wh what seals, I said, yelling at him with anger and frustration. I, I haven't broken any seals. Oh, but you have, my son. Four so far, and you're on your way to the final one. Then he'll be set free. I looked down at the dying man before me, my knife above his heart. Seals. Seals, you mean him. He's just an escapee, they all were. I sent them back, I didn't have any choice. The angel sighed. Yes, they are escapees. But so much more. You see, in the beginning, when Lucifer was cast down and imprisoned, five great seals inscribed with the very word of God were put in place to hold him, confine him. He could not touch them unless he suffered the true death. And he'd be returned back to the universe. But his will is not so easily cemented. If he could not touch them, then he would change them. And so, over the long millennia, he bent his terrible will towards them, until at last they become incorporeal. Much to his frustration, he still could not leave. But perhaps they could. And so he found five of the most evil souls in hell, and placed them inside, using all of his will, and with the seal somewhat weakened. He made the smallest of cracks between this world and the hell of his own making, and set them free. But the seals were never made of this world. 
and grew even weaker. Yet Lucifer could not lay his hands upon them, or he wasn't willing to try for fear of the true death, and so he groomed you to do it for him. From the moment of your conception, he used you. He put the knife in your hand on earth, put another in your hand in hell, an instrument not forged in hellfire, but forged in heaven. Just as my brother Michael, his sword, so Lucifer had his knife. My brother still bears the scars of its terrible wrath. I looked toward Lucifer, his face impassive. Is that true, you son of a bitch? Is, is it all true? Every word of it, he smiled. I answered that smile with one of my own. I won't do it. I won't set you free. Not now, not ever. You can rot in hell for all eternity. If that's your decision, I respect it. He nodded thoughtfully. But, before you decide, I mean really decide, just... Ask him one question, he said, nodding towards the glowing angel. That's all I ask, just one tiny question. What question? I spat at him. Ask him if you will go to heaven. I mean, if you stay your hand, you will have defeated God's most hated enemy. You will have saved billions of men, women, innocent children from annihilation. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. Ask him. Will I? I said, turning back to Gabriel. If I do this, if I save the world, if I trap Lucifer, will I finally be at peace? Will I, will I see the face of God? Can I... Can I be forgiven? The angel smiled sadly. There can be no redemption for one such as you, my son. Your action condemned you to hell when you murdered all of those innocent people. But... But you said... He made me do it. He, he stole my free will. He used me, I roared. You said it yourself. You, he made me do it. They don't care, Lucifer said, falling upon his knees before me and grabbing up my face, my nose almost touching his. Don't you understand? They don't fucking care. Ask yourself, my son. Couldn't they have stopped it? Is God not all-powerful? All those nights I whispered into your lonely crib from the depths of my own forsaken hell. Could God not have silenced my voice the first time you slit an innocent throat? Could God not have stayed your hand? Yes. Yes, he could, but he didn't. He didn't care enough about you to stop it. Not only. See, only now, only now when it matters do they bother to even acknowledge your existence and try to manipulate you. And what do they offer in return? Nothing. Only an eternity trapped in hell. They simply don't care. Why should you serve them? For the glory of God, huh? He barked a harsh laugh. Is that their reason? Is that their best offer? I'm offering you a place by my side. Together, we'll take this world, we'll shape it into our own image. You are my son, Christian. I placed my hand over your heart the moment it let out its first beat. I looked at him, and knew for the first time, perhaps in an eternity of existence, he was speaking the truth. I turned to the waiting angel. Tell your God. I said, bite me. No! The angel screamed as I fought off its spell and brought what was left of the hellbound blade whistling down, breaking the final seal.
We were standing atop a great hill. Below us, a huge battle raged between angels and demons. In the midst of this fury was a man with a silver sword who raged amongst demon kind, slaughtering all before him. Who's he? I asked Lucifer, who stood beside me watching the battle intently. Masterson, Lucifer growled. Another god-cursed Masterson. Wild card. The eye in the center of a storm. But not to worry, he smiled. He can change nothing. So, what shall we do next? He grinned as the chaos continued below us. I closed my eyes, smelling the ashes, a small smile playing across my lips. Now we set it to burn. Now we burn them all. His hand fell upon my shoulder. It felt good there, like the embrace of an old friend, like a lover's kiss. But best of all, it felt like coming home. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at Chilling. If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you can select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Jeff Vernon, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pettis Pleaser, Gaddis, Joseph Calarudo, Would It Be, Dante Kincaid, Watson 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emmer Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Escadine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Michael Mel, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80 Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mom. Here is Loth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Cory Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>